rescheduled February 26, 2019 governing board meeting of CV Fiber to order. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> town meeting is coming up. It is. And many of us will probably go. And we what's going on? With so I wonder if there's anything official to do or just give our own renditions of what we think is going on. Well, I um, hope you brought a pencil. There's, there's a lot of stuff to write down. Well, stuff that's happened since our last meeting. So, um, how you want to communicate that, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, we will also have we have, to have another meeting in a few, in a few weeks too. Um, that will probably be shorter. Right here. Um, but I think most most of the interesting stuff will be today. Um, but there's still some, still some things outstanding that hopefully identify. Um, is there anything that we need to add to the agenda or change or otherwise? We're still good, uh, good, good for all the presentations of everybody, I, I hope. Um, OK, uh, any public comment on items that are not on the agenda? <coughs> I would like to give I, um, oh, I yeah, have, sorry, no. I have a question, Jeremy. Do we include, at this place, comments we've gotten from the public? That, that would be fine. Yeah, this is actually a really great place for that. Okay, uh, because I did have one person call me up the, the day the story of when you said we could have internet by the end of 2020. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, it was 2019. 2019. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's in our budget. Well, I thought it was great that somebody was calling me up because it showed that he was eager for it. Mm -hmm. and, and he read the paper and he actually they got to the point you. where you said what you did. Mm -hmm. So people are, people are paying attention. Cool. That was my public comment. Great. So uh, on a related um, a related note, thank you for calling that out. Um, I have a little, you got one of the printed copies that I made. There's a little chairs note in the upper right-hand corner. It says, anyone willing to write an article for the bridge tying our efforts to real estate? <clears throat> I'm talking about property values or anything like that, or more generally what we're doing, but uh, they're doing a real estate themed issue during the next time around, and they will they'll essentially give us a half half a page for us to write whatever. Don't you want to do that? You guys can work on it together. It's all, it's all good. Um, <coughs> set, if, we, if you could both, um, <laughs> what's the deadline? <laughs> you, got, you got about a little bit less than me. Okay. Still okay? And I have just I get contact over right here. Um, <laughs> just write, write good stuff. There you go. Here's your guidelines. I used, to write write I used to write for newspapers. Great. I will. I will put you in touch with their with their editor. And uh, yeah. And if you have um, and David, especially if you have if you have graphics too. Well, I also can get some quotes from real estate agents. There you go. Okay. If anybody wants to offer quotes to uh, David and Becca, that would be that'd be great. Okay. Any other public comment or any other items that are not on the agenda that anybody feels like they want to weigh in on? I made a poster that I had sent to Elliot. But I haven't heard back from him yet. But I have it, and I gave it to my town clerk to put up. It's got actually pull tabs. I've got it, so the actual pull tabs. But I've also got QR codes on it that take you to the donation page and the .net page, um, or not the .net page, the net. Mm -hmm. The web presence. Sorry, yes, the web presence, and um, it has a little blurb about just fr from our website, basically what it says and what our member towns are, and. I'm going to be putting that up at my office because I've been kind of talking us up around the office. And one of the women said, well, gee, if you had a poster up in the lunchroom, I'd read that. So so I, I made that, but I, kind of, I didn't know how to distribute it. It's send, you can send it to me. You can broadcast it to everybody. Yes. And if okay. you sent me a copy, I'd post it. And, okay. and, and that's and that might be a good a good thing in advance of, of town meeting to have that there and, and to, do the, to do the ask for funds mm -hmm. and such. Um, okay. Yeah, that would be good. Um, and I want to in introduce Frank Moore, who is um, replacing Rama as the main uh, delegate from Williamstown. Frank works at Norwich with me, and uh, I will let him 
you want to give yourself a quick introduction, maybe we'll, and then we'll do a round of introductions. So okay. you know, I'm terrible with names, so it's going to take two or three meetings. That's, that, the name that, that's right. There's a there's a video recording. You can watch all this over oh. and over. Again. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I have a busy day. Of course, of course. Um, so I moved here a year and a half ago from the Seattle area, and I was in Seattle for four years. And prior to that, I was. Um, tenured faculty member and chief information officer at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia, which is as rural as it sounds. It's a town the size of Northfield and was the only shopping town in eight counties. Um, and I sat on the board of directors and chaired the audit and finance committee for Mid-Atlantic Broadband, which built um, an 800-mile uh, fiber network in Virginia that connected every healthcare facility, every K through 20 institution, and 56 business parks. And then we also built a fiber network from Atlanta to Ashburn, Virginia. Um, I was doing that for seven years and it was a lot of fun. Our biggest challenge actually, I shouldn't say this, was not getting the money because Virginia's a tobacco state and got millions and millions of dollars in tobacco settlement money, which is how we financed it. But the biggest challenge was the last mile from the backbone to the house. <laughs> which is what I'm sure you're finding here. My biggest fear of moving to Williamstown was I'd have no broadband. I'm almost 2,000 feet above sea level on the side of the mountain east uh, uh, of Williamstown on Baptist Street. And I actually did find wireless broadband that is, so far it's been phenomenal for three months. So, do you want to, um, Becca, you want to introduce me? Sure. Here's the circle. I'm Becca Schrader, I'm the clerk and treasurer, and I live in East Montpelier. I'm David Healy, I'm the delegate from the town of Cowles. Okay. Jeremy Hanson, Berlin. Shabbat Shalom, Orange. Chris Riddell, Berry City. Andrew Gilbert, Cabot. And I'm Alan Gilbert, I'm from Worcester. And Robert Schneider from Williamstown, so. <laughs> I think we've met. Yes, we have, <laughs> not too long ago. Jerry DMT is the alternate delegate from Berlin and also the chair of the business development committee. Okay. You gonna join us? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke is burned out from Sanfield. Okay. And Bob Quinn from Houston. Okay, good. Well it's nice meeting you all. All right, and I, I have uh, Stephen um, Nelton from um, Washington Electric Co op here on my computer, so if you hear voices coming from here, that's that's who that is. Um, can you hear me, Stephen? I can see you, but I can't hear you. Does this sound like every every video conferencing meeting that uh, I've yeah. ever? I can I can see you. I I don't have my camera on. I, I'm not. Uh, okay. Uh, we can hear I can, well, hold on. We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you now. You're good. <laughs> no, you're you're good. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back. Where uh, any other public comment on items that are not on the agenda? Okay, um, next one, Woodbury's petition to join CV Fiber. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting with Woodbury Select Board and talking to them about what we've been doing. Um, they, they approached me after I spoke to uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission um, and they said, hey, this is something that we would be interested in pursuing. So I met with them and they said, hey, we want into, especially before you start building stuff and then we have to pay to join. So. They were very enthusiastic, asked great questions, and uh, are interested in joining. So what, let's say, you all. Any thoughts? It's grand. Good. <laughs> <laughs> the closest to the state spiver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, yeah. that, is that true? Okay. It goes to hardware. Yeah. So, so if we're ever going nice to if we're ever going to interconnect with Kingdom Fiber, we probably need to go yeah, up that it's way. It's a nice little, it's a nice little Keystone spot. <laughs> and they were, and they were, they were convinced that they were never going to have any, I mean, never going to have any, any options. I mean, even even fewer than than some other places. I think you know, at least at least Worcester is on uh, Route 12. Cabot's at least on Route 2. Mm -hmm. Although I guess I hope Woodbury has Route, route 2 there as well. But route 14. I'm route sorry. 14. That's that's what yeah. I think. Anyways, um, is there any reason why we shouldn't? No. Okay. And, uh, okay. So I'll I'll make a motion. 
Ex except for who we don't know. <laughs> but I don't know. I make a motion that we accept Mr. Participation in the CP5. Okay. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Motion passes unanimously. Woodbury has um, actually, in anticipation of this, has already appointed their representative. And I um, skip Lindsay. I don't see Skip here. He was invited and maybe showing up. He was supposed to be showing up. But um, if he shows up and looks kind of confused, I'll ask him just to sit down and we'll do the introductions again. Uh, okay. Treasurer's report. Becca. Yes. <clears throat> um, so we currently have um, $5,345.63. Um, all but plus 250 that I'm not going to do math in public. Um, <laughs> uh, 25 of that is in our savings account and the rest is in checking. Um, we've received a total of $5,386.69 um, in donations. Um, and so the difference is um, our the online website, the website that we use for a donor that we take online donations, um, charges a fee. Um, they take a little slice of those donations. So that's all the expenses. Cool. So there's the, the, the practical matter of if we get the, if we get the grant, the $12,500 grant, we have $7,500 more roughly to go. So think, think about how we're gonna bridge that because if they say, yeah, you've got the grant, let's, let's see your bank account, we're gonna need to move. When do you expect to find that information out? I, I thought that was end of February. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be end of January. Okay. Then it was end of February. Then it was last week. I sent an e I sent an email yesterday. Are they relying on any federal input on that? No, I, I, I asked. I, I asked if there was any funding pulled up, and they said no. They're just waiting to get their ducks in a row and to announce. So they're going to have some sort of press conference or something to announce that. Has there been any resolution of the uh, <clears throat> doing business name of Central Vermont Internet? What's that timeline? When, when, when did that hearing happen, Rama? Do you know? I have to go back into my calendar. But I mean, we should be hearing sometime, actually sometime pretty soon, shouldn't we? It was about a, it was in the, towards the end of January. Let's see. Well, what, one know. of the reasons I ask is that if if anybody is trying to verify for, say, a foundation, a charitable foundation or a charitable gift foundation, whether we exist, if they go to the Secretary of State's website and type in Central Vermont Internet, they end up with the mm -hmm. company that is not us. Right. So um, it, that was a 30-day window, Rama? Yeah. That happened It happened on January 28th, so we, yeah, we, we, we must know right. by um, tomorrow. Okay. Also, Alan, I just remembered, you'd asked me for that EIN, right? Yeah. Because that should help as well. I, yes. tr I tried that EIN and it didn't come up with us. Oh. It's, it's, we're kind of blank if people, if there's a charitable gift trust that's trying to verify whether a <coughs> gift to us is tax deductible, they wouldn't be able to do it at this point. Hmm. Uh, Follow up and ver verify that, that that can actually happen? Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised in the EIN yeah. doesn't work. I'll, I'll check with you, Becca, to make sure I have the right number. Right. Okay. You know, I wrote it down last time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any any other questions for Becca or other treasurer slash money items? Okay. Next up, we have Sherry McCuller from Magellan Advisors. Welcome. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. If you want to uh, set up wherever you'd like, unfortunately we don't. Have, we don't have a screen. Yeah, but that's okay. That's fine. Um, what, all I need to do is so everybody can see. It. You want a table or something? Put here. Or if you can like, email one of us, or email me, or somebody uh, your presentation, I can, I can distribute to everybody and we can just follow along. Oh, that's okay. Do you, you have my email address? Uh, I 
Yeah, the, the Wi-Fi password's low, lowercase M D L S X P U B one two three four five. It's P, not D. Was it D? M, M D L S X. D is in David. Middle sex, yes. Yeah, 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 like yeah. middle sex club. <laughs> <laughs> Should I get on the middle sex guest? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now tell me again. M D. M D L. M D L. S X P U B. P U B. One, two, three, four, five. Through the fun, we are just to confuse us. <laughs> did, did you purge the money part of it, Sherry? Pardon? Did you purge the money part of the first? Oh no, yeah. Well, actually, I didn't. Let me take that off. Thank you. thing out there called the five. Did you say you were from um, the, the Virginia Middle Mile Backbone Network? Um, Mid-Atlantic Broadband, yeah. You're with Mid-Atlantic? I, I used to be. Okay. I know their work really well. Yeah. I yeah. remember when it was funded. That's a They've great done project. a lot. Yeah, it really helped North Carolina a lot, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can get to Ashburn now. All right, I got it, Sherry. If you, if you want to start, I will I'll circulate it while you're Okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Sherry McCullough, and I'm a senior broadband consultant with Magellan Advisors. Um, and before I get started, I just want to say that I love this photograph. <laughs> Being here uh, reminds me of my hometown where I live. We're in an area that looks almost exactly like this in the mountains of western North Carolina. And it's very uh, sparsely populated. It's very low density. I think we have maybe seven households a mile. We have a rural electric co-op. Um, we also have broadband thanks to a grant that we got. And I helped to get that grant for our county. But um, I know a lot about business planning for rural development projects and it's hard to do. So, uh, but there is a way and it is profitable and it does work. It just takes patient capital and committed partnerships to do. So first I want to just go over this uh, agenda a little bit and give you a little overview of our company and our services and our project team and uh, talk a little bit about projects that are relevant to what you're doing here and uh, why we're here. And then our proposed scope of work if you all uh, retain us or your partner retains us. And then uh, just as some additional information, there are grants available now for broadband planning that you might want to look into. And then I'm going to try to save enough time for questions. I'm going to uh, try to keep this under an hour so you guys can get some work done uh, tonight. I know we have other people here. So first, I want to talk about the scope of work. <coughs> this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is to be determined. I'm sorry. <coughs> but um, essentially, we're going to, we want to do the business planning, the financial modeling, partnership development, fundraising, either from grants or subsidized loans, and we would like to suggest a pilot project. So Magellan Advisors. Um, Magellan Advisors has been in business for going on nine years. Uh, it made a big splash when it hit the scene and uh, when BTOC started. 
Since then, we've done over 400 projects for public and nonprofit clients. We've built over 50 networks across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we've raised over a billion dollars for broadband funding. We connected over one million feet of fiber to the premise connections. Uh, we've connected over 1,000 community anchor institutions. And so that number, these numbers are two years old, but I have to tell you that right now we've got $175 million in projects from Canada to Alaska. So we know a lot about rural broadband. <laughs> um, we do feasibility studies, broadband engineering and design, uh, business modeling and partnership development, <coughs> financing and grants, and project management. Um, this slide you know, goes into detail about the exact services that we, we provide, but... Which slide are you on, Sherry? I'm sorry. Pardon? Which slide are you on? Uh, sorry. Let me go back. This is slide number four. Um, we can do comprehensive work in any of these areas. We do a lot of smart city projects across the US, and these are mostly in bigger cities. Um, Rancho Cucamonga, California, San Francisco, um, city planning, financial planning, economic modeling, scenario planning, sensitivity analysis, break-even analysis, design and engineering. Uh, we have a full design engineering firm, but we keep it separated from our planning business. We don't do planning and design engineering. We do planning and then design engineering if you're interested to go forward, but we don't mix the two. Um, the government IT consulting is a big part of our business. In fact, that's how Magellan got started was with municipal IT consulting and security consulting. We are a full project management firm, and we also provide operational startup support for new ventures. Uh, so next slide. So these are some of the areas where we have built fiber. Uh, these are fiber to home systems for municipalities, for cooperatives or clients of ours. We've done work for states, for regional development authorities. We build middle mile networks, last mile networks. We do high speed wireless and cellular data networks. Uh, Smart Grid is a big part of our, our project work over the last year in states that have just passed laws that allow electric co-ops to build broadband systems now, which is something new in a lot of states. Uh, we do smart home automation, grid security, energy efficiency projects. Transportation is a big deal for some of our municipal clients. Uh, health care, telehealth, telemedicine. We've raised a lot of money for rural telemedicine networks and Wyoming was our latest project. Public safety, of course, is a huge uh, area for Magellan. So for this project, the CB Fiber Project, what we're proposing to do is to start with a business plan and a financial model. And then look at partnership opportunities for CB Fiber because as a new entity, without assets or a revenue stream or history of operations, it's gonna to be tough for you guys to raise the money on your own. So definitely some partnership opportunities. And then recommend an organizational structure for the venture, identify the applicant for the funding, and then go after funding. Loan funding from subsidized federal loans, state grants, and federal grants. You're a really good fit for all of those three. So our team, John Honker is the president and CEO of Magellan, and John has a lot of experience working in uh, Vermont. Velco is one of our clients, a current client, and John has personally worked on that project for going on the last three years. Courtney Violet is our chief operating officer, and Courtney is a former city CIO. Courtney and I are working together on a project in rural Canada. We recently did the business planning and raised $68 million for a remote area in Northern Canada. It was the largest grant award in Ontario history and the largest federal award in the country. And it connects five remote fly-in only communities with a fiber to the home system and an 800 kilometer fiber backpack. So we're really proud of that project. Um, you can read all about me. <laughs> I used to be with an investment bank for 20 years in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
And when I retired from the firm, I moved to the mountains of Western North Carolina, thinking that I would do software development, which I enjoy. But quickly discovered that there was no broadband. And in fact, <laughs> there was no T1 line. Uh, the telephone company at the time, who was GTE, said, well, we can probably get a T1 up there where you live, but it might take us about three months. So I spent the next three years on the road because I had to go to my client's site to be able to communicate. It was awful. And finally, my family, uh, and my husband is with me today because we are going to Alaska. I got to come to Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're traveling on. But um, my family finally said, look, either do something about the situation so that you can stay home or we're all moving back to Charlotte. <laughs> because you know they never saw me. And so that's how I got interested in broadband. As an economic development strategy for rural areas, it's really the only thing we had. You know, we're remote, low density, don't have a lot of businesses, and don't have the state, barely knows that we're part of the state. And so we don't have flat land, we have a lot of mountain land, we have severe uh, weather, we have a lot of public land that doesn't belong to us. And so really, you know, we don't have housing, we can't house big, big box manufacturing companies. We don't even have roads, they're very good. They go up through the mountains. So really the only thing we have is broadband. And so that's how I got into it and I've been doing this for 20 years. So really I got into it for the children. Uh, I found out that our local school could not teach advanced chemistry or biochemistry because there weren't enough kids to hire a teacher to make it feasible. And so one of the first projects I did was raise money to connect 11 school districts together to the two community colleges and the state university. And they own their own fiber optic network. And it saved them $65 million. And it's still operating, it's a great project. So now the little kids can just share a teacher, no matter where the teacher is. You, you can read about me. Dan Howick is our VP of Design and Construction. Dan came from uh, Danella, which is one of the two largest construction firms in the US for utility networks. Um, Mark Lane is our inside plant engineer. Mark is fantastic. He managed Bristol, Virginia Utilities Fiber to Home Network System, which is one of the longest operating municipal utilities in the US, which ultimately got to 68% broadband adoption, which is amazing. Uh, and then Ashley Poling, who's our project management analyst, who keeps us all straight. And then lastly, Dave Brevitz. Dave is our policy and regulatory guy. If we have questions about what's legal in states, we put Dave on it. So why are we here? We're here because we know what you're going through. <laughs> um, access to broadband has become the gateway to equal opportunity. I argue that it's become a civil right. And the reason it's a civil right is because legislators, by their actions, can deny it to certain classes of people. If you don't have the internet, you don't have equal opportunity. Um, the FCC's policy of subsidizing aging copper network has utterly failed rural communities. We now have a, a network that is falling apart in the ground that can't get much above 25 megabits. And by my last count, I think the FCC had spent $19 billion on subsidizing that network through the Connect America Fund. So pretending that 10 megabits of service is broadband uh, and pretending that's going to meet the rural needs of communities, it's not going to solve the problem that we all have. Um, we did some research on Vermont before we came here. And I have some background in Vermont because I worked with EC Fiber and with Kingdom Fiber through the VTA back in 2014 to put together a plan to participate in the Rural Broadband Experiments Auction, um, which the rules changed after some of the provisional awards were made, and that wasn't a good thing. So I learned a lot about Vermont and Vermont Internet Service during that time. And one of the things that I learned was that VTAL got a $116 million broadband stimulus award to build a 4G wireless network. And uh, they did do that, but I don't think a lot of people are getting 10 one service. Unfortunately, I think Vermont is cursed by that because VTEL is a RUS borrower. And RUS will not make grants or loans in areas where there's an existing RUS borrower. 
So one of the things that we did was overlay a map of CB5 serving area with VTAIL serving area. And the good news is there are places where the two don't overlap. That means there's access to RUS funding and grants in those areas. It does make the business case a little harder to serve the ones where there is overlap. And we actually think that um, the Vermont Public Service Commission did a test of all of the wireless services that were in the area. <clears throat> and it was really amazing if you can see the yellow dots on the map and the red dots. Those are the sites where they tested that don't get 10-1. So we think you should file a waiver request with RUS and ask them if they will lift the restriction on additional RUS funding because VTAIL is not actually meeting its statutory obligation. So it's a long shot uh, because at the end of the day, RUS is a bank and it's going to protect its borrowers, but it's still worth the try. <clears throat> that could open up the whole area for funding. And of course, state grants would not be subject to the same restrictions. So CB5 is a startup. Uh, where do you go from here? Uh, you know, I recognize a lot of the people on this, the delegates on this committee and members of your board are very well versed in rural broadband, engineering, business planning, all of the existing networks, the needs, the gaps. You already know a lot of that. And Magellan Advisors usually starts our work with feasibility studies, surveys to measure demand, stakeholder engagement to test the reliability and cost of services that are available. But recognizing that you're a startup and that access to funding right now is difficult, and also recognizing that you have a body of expertise already existing here, we think that we could work with you to get the information we need and just skip those two steps and start with a business plan. We think there's enough expertise here to be able to develop a business plan. So, you know, the thing that you need more than anything else right now is a business plan. You can't raise money, you can't apply for funding, you can't even find a partner until you have one. And let's talk about partnerships. You know, we, we do a lot of work in rural areas, we do a lot of public private and nonprofit public partnerships. And as I said, I've worked mostly in rural areas for my 20 year career. And what we see as the fastest, lowest cost way to get services out in rural areas like this is to form a partnership with a cooperative, either an electric cooperative or a telephone cooperative or both. Uh, in Oregon, one of our projects in a rural area is with a uh, co-op that is a co-op of co-ops. <laughs> there's an electric co-op and there's a telephone co-op and between the two, they have access to two sources of federal funding. And they formed a separate joint venture. So it's really a great project. And by the way, the USDA Rural Utility Service loves cooperatives because they trust them. Most of them are already existing borrowers. They know them, they know feel comfortable making loans and grants. So we think that probably your best partner, without doing the business plan or even looking at all of the aspects, but just right off the bat, we think your best partner is going to be a cooperative. And it's probably going to be your electric cooperative because you don't have a telephone cooperative. Uh, they own their own homes. The whole fees alone in your business plan, whole fees in a business plan for a rural community can actually bankrupt a small organization. It's the single largest cost, that and make rate, of any of the costs that you're going to see in your plan. And if you can eliminate those costs, your business plan looks a lot better, a lot faster. Also, you can leverage the facilities that are already in place. So, uh, and also you've got access to $5.5 million a year of federal appropriation funds that goes not to the telecommunications program of RUS, but to the electric program. And that money is not restricted. There are no restrictions on the size of the loan, unlike the telecom program is limited to $10 million per project. This, there is no limit. There's also no restriction on overbuilding existing carriers, except
except for our U.S. carriers. But if you've got a, you know, a charter or an AT&T, it's fine. You can use the money to open the door. <coughs> and that makes a big difference in the rural business case. Because, you know, what happens in rural areas is the incumbent carriers essentially cherry pick the densest area, leaving the unserved area out in the boondocks um, it's really hard to serve and expensive to serve, and there are not of them to make the business case. So um, we can talk more about the smart grid line, but essentially the head of the, the smart grid project for the electric side came from the telecommunications side, his name is John Platt. And John switched programs a few years ago and introduced the smart grid idea. They know that you're going to use the money to build broadband networks, and they want you to. But you don't talk about that in your funding application. You talk about the benefits of the smart grid network and all of the savings that it's going to create for rural electric co-ops. And it is going to create savings. Uh, for one thing, you can operate your electronics in real time remotely, which can make a big difference. It helps you manage your load. You can save money on peak power cost. And it lets consumers access their own appliances remotely over the internet to serve power themselves. So, but mainly, uh, as we've seen in electric cities and electric co-ops, revenues from electric services are trending down, and they have been for many years. And so the broadband service is a way to diversify the revenue and increase the revenue stream. <laughs> and, and so they, our U.S. electric program knows you're going to have a fiber optic network. They know you're going to offer broadband service. They're glad you're going to, and they encourage you to. But politically, and I'm talking about <coughs> funding from lobbyists for the industry, <coughs> hasn't worked its way over to the electric program yet. <laughs> well. They have worked over the telecom program pretty well. <coughs> and so everybody's marching to the lobby sheet of music except on the electric side. And so while we've got this money available, I think we all need to go for it while it's still available. <laughs> because <clears throat> money in Washington is like a float in a swimming pool. It just keeps moving around with every new administration. And what's allowable today may not be allowable tomorrow. So the other thing we like about electric co-ops <coughs> and telephone co-ops is that their, their capital is patient. The private sector, and I'm talking about venture capitalists, private equity funds, you know, they're not going to invest in areas like this. They simply are not going to do it. Because the return on investment and the time period to free cash flow is too long. Most of the telephone companies will not make investments unless they see a return within 18 months. They won't invest at all if there's not a return in five years. And it usually takes seven to ten years uh, in rural areas. Ten years would be a good thing in rural areas. So you need patient capital. Co-ops know how to do that. They also know how to serve rural areas on thinner margins. So now I'm going to tell you a story about why the private sector is never going to do this. When VTOC came out, I was working in eastern North Carolina, which is really rural, really poor, and really hard to serve. They have islands. And so the university system applied for some VTOP money to build a state middle mile green, and I worked with them to do that. And so as my job, I'm not sure how I got this job, but my job was to go out to the private sector incumbents and get them to support the plan and invest in the match for the money. So I must have offended somebody. But so I went to the carrier at that time, and I won't tell you their name because we had an NDA. But they were the carrier for all of Eastern North Carolina. And I said, I think we can get $140 million in federal money. And you don't want to be the applicant because you don't want to have to deal with compliance. Also, you're not going to allow open access to your network, which is a requirement to be talking. I said, but if you work with us, then you can have some of this fiber to all of your cell sites at a very low cost. and." You can be the contractor to help us build it, and you won't be subject to any compliance obligations whatsoever. You'll just be a contractor. How does that sound? 
And the director for North Carolina looked at me and he said, you know, if somebody gave us $100 million tomorrow with no strings whatsoever attached, we would not take it and build a phone with North Carolina. <laughs> and I said, why not? And they said, because we can't reach our internal rate of return threshold. And so, you know, there are national companies, <coughs> stockholders to satisfy, I understand that. I worked for an investment bank. Once you have public stockholders, you're a, a human captive. <laughs> and, and I do understand it. But the point is, they're not going to do it. And so we've got to look uh, to alternatives. And that's what I've been doing for 20 years. And so what I'm saying to you is, and I don't, WEC is here tonight, Barry's everywhere. So I'm not going to say that Barry has agreed to do this because under no circumstances he said that. <laughs> but I will say that if you ask me today, based on what I know after 20 years of experience, I would say what you need to do is form a partnership with Washington Electric Cooperative. And then Washington Electric Cooperative should form a partnership with, CD, with uh, EC Bobber and with Kingdom Bobber to be able to operate the system and start it up because WEC doesn't have any operating experience in that area. So between the three of you, four of you, uh, it would be a plan that could work quickly. It would leverage the assets that are already in place, the home ownership, facilities, the electronics, the knowledge and the experience, the regulatory piece. With you guys, and what you would bring to the table would be the aggregated demand of 16, maybe 17 communities. You would be the community support and engagement piece, which is going to be necessary for you to get public funding. RUS especially looks at community engagement and support as one of the ways they rank their applications. And so CB Fiber would play a very important role. Uh, you would have to endorse the partner. Now, we're doing other projects like this right now. We're doing one in Alaska. And we're working in the Aleutian and Kribloff Islands, which really has a problem. The schools out there are paying $60,000 a month for a satellite interconnection, and E-Rate is paying for 90% of it. Talk about a good business plan. The incumbent carrier is making $22 million a year, every year, off the schools. Uh, and it's killing them. I mean, they can't, they can't, even though they're paying 10%, it's still killing them. So they want competition. There are four carriers. It's a really tough business model, believe me, because it's submarine cable. So what we did was we said, okay, we're going to go talk to the four carriers. There's $600 million of federal funding on the table right now from the reconnect funding opportunity. Are you all aware of that? Okay. So, but you have to move fast. And so the community network, which is a confederation of those 16 communities that the emissions of Kribblox, it's called Southwest Aleutian Municipal Conference. They are the city property. They coordinate the municipalities, and they have they carry a lot of weight. Uh, so we went to the incumbent carrier and said, you know, here's our guiding principles. We want to see lower cost services. We want to see higher reliability. We want to see faster speeds. We want jobs created in the communities where people live as part of the deployment. We want you to do business as much as possible with the little companies. And, you know, here's a list of other things. <laughs> You've got to be experienced, your plan's got to be feasible, all of that. And they said, well, uh, what kind of community benefits are you talking about? And I said, well, a lifeline link-up uh, discount would be nice. Or maybe you could give free service to a technical college for a while, for, you know, to do some adoption training. And they're like, you must not know our business model. <laughs> Which is to charge the school $60,000. 60, <laughs> so, you know, basically they didn't offer anything, they sort of had that until we didn't call them back. Because what they realize now is that that community municipal conference has a lot of power. And we are actually negotiating with the other three characters who hate the incumbent. So they're thinking about forming a group to work together to submit a proposal. And it's up to the four carriers to determine who's going to get the backing of the municipal conference, but they have a lot of power that they didn't know they have. I kind of hate the incumbent too, just hearing about it. And you know, <laughs> they, they do have money, but they don't want to own the network. 
they're not in that business, they don't want to maintain it, they, they don't want to own it. So they would be very happy to have a partner. Um, I'm not going to go through all of my slides. You guys can read it for your reading pleasure later on, but I want to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. But, um, you know, there are different models. Uh, you don't want to do it. If the numbers don't work out, uh, and there's going to have to be a business plan that shows that it works out for everybody. Uh, and if it's not to Washington Electric Cooperative's liking, or DC Fibers, or Kingdoms, there are other models. Um, and there are private sector models. So, you know, but I, just right off the top of our head, to save you time and to save you money, we're giving you our best thinking tonight after the our research. So, are there any questions about anything I've said so far? So, I, 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 I have a question. I, we're always curious why people show up in Vermont. How, how did you even know that we were doing this? Is it just because of the work you've done in the state before? Can well, you some of the players? Yes, we do. Um, we know Belco. Because Belco is a current client. It has been for a couple of years. We've talked to Mike and uh, Lucy at Belco about this. We know uh, Michael here. Because we helped him develop this plan for this fiber optic network where he switched from wireless to fiber. And VTA brought us in. We bid on the business. VTA awarded it to us because, uh, well, they, I was uh, working with the university system at the time, but because we know rural areas. And one of the first questions they asked us was, how do you define rural? And, you know, we kind of laughed, but they weren't kidding. <laughs> they wanted to know the answer to that question. And we said, well, you know, anything, uh, if you've got 10 households per mile, that's a great business model for a rural area. And they were like, we've got four <laughs> in the Northeast Kingdom. And so they want people who understand that and who aren't going to try to do things according to a boilerplate template that doesn't work in Vermont. And that's why they brought us on board. And so we met Stan and his group, and they didn't need our help, but Michael was transitioning from wireless to wireless, and so he needed a business plan. And BTA's interest was to lease some of the fiber that they had already built using uh, public funds to carriers who were willing to build high capacity networks in the rural areas, specifically the Northeast Kingdom, uh, East South Central Vermont. And so it was challenging. Um, let me just say that this, uh, the design was interesting. So when Michael and I first met, we talked about distribution networks, and I was like, well, wait a minute. I was like, I'm looking at this, and I don't see a distribution network. And Michael said, because there isn't one. And I said, what? Well, how do we get the houses? He goes, they're all along the road. <laughs> We have long drops. We had long drops. Uh, it, it was pretty innovative. Michael is amazing uh, with the research that he has done, and he identifies some very low cost equipment and gear and solutions that make the plan work. And so that's how we came to know about this. We also read about um, the Communications Union District legislation because we follow public policy state by state. Yes. Is there a role for Velco in any of this? Yes, definitely. <coughs> um, because, you know, Velco, should have mentioned that, Velco can drop transmission fiber at the substations for well. And that's a huge deal. If you don't have an upstream connection, like, like we didn't have in Virginia and North Carolina before you guys and we started doing our work, it's a big problem. Uh, the city of Wilson, North Carolina, was the first municipal fiber in the home network in the state. They had a great plan to set that. They didn't think about their upstream connection. And, you know, Level 3 and Zayo and those guys, they don't, they're not regulated. They can charge any price they want. And guess what? Their two biggest customers were the city's two biggest competitors who hated the city and their network who wanted them to go away. And so all of a sudden, the price for upstream connectivity went from $4 a megabit, which at that time was a good price, to $175 a megabit. So that upstream connection is a tremendously important piece of this, and we all can provide that. Any other questions? This reminds me of the horror story back in Virginia in about 2007, <coughs> because 
NBC was set up as a cooperative, and the members were ISPs. So it was a 501c12. And we hit a point in time where the ISPs were supposed to roll over according to the rules to the board of directors. And we realized it would have brought chaos because they compete with each other for customers. So we went through a whole period of a year with the IRS converting to a 501c4. And when we started up, Verizon and Sprint, and I will name them, said we were going to be an utter failure and they refused to cooperate with us. And within two years, they realized they better join. <coughs> yeah, the best way to get them to do anything is to threaten to do something yourself. That's right. All of a sudden, they'll start building all over the place. Do you might, I don't know, you can answer this hopefully, but it's helpful to have a sense of your engagement model or how much Ellen does this just because of the chicken and egg on the food phase. This is the other thing that goes on. And we don't, and we don't have any really. We're, we're a little challenged operationally too, just because of the nature of what we are. We, you, I think you tugged it right. What we really represent is community interest, and the, you know, putting that all together and the demand aspect of it. But we're not really an operational body. So we do need these partners, but a chicken and egg is not really a partner of it. So, do you have any insight on how that might work? Like, I mean, without getting into it. So. First of all, there is funding out there for planning, and I would encourage you all to apply. So, and in fact, there's a window open right now for, I think it's $50,000. It's not a lot of money, but $50,000 is a lot of money for us. About more than <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, it, It'd be better if, it, and, and I think there's some state legislation uh, that's pending right now that would also make funds available for planning, as well as other important uh, changes <coughs> that we made in the state. 60,000. 60, 60,000. That's right. So, Michael has been talking to me and sending a copy of the bill language. So, that's a, so there are ways to raise some money to do this. But let's talk about time. Yeah, and that's yeah. Right. Because right now, the reconnect opportunity is on the table. And the grant window is going to be announced sometime in mid March. We know what the closing dates are, we don't know what the opening dates are. It's too late in the game for you guys to apply for that. You don't have a business plan. You don't have a farm. You don't have design engineering. Uh, but uh, there are recurring programs for marine waste that happen every year. And usually they open up about this time of the year. So right now you have the Community Connect grant window is open. Telemedicine, just as long as it's open. Uh, rural Economic Development business grants are open. And the Reconnect is open. And Smart Grid is open all the time. Smart grid line. So we think that it's going to be a combination of grants and loans. But before you even consider that, you've got to do the business plan. And you know, I would suggest that we do it in concert with Washington Electric Power. Don't shoot me, Henry. <laughs> but I mean, the co-op can't do anything until they have a business model where they know they can be whole and it's going to meet their needs and it's going to solve the problem. Um, and so, they, since they would be the applicant, the applicant must own the assets that are funded. And they must be willing to operate them or to hire an operator to do it. And so, since they would have to be the applicant, then really it needs to be their business plan with your input. So, I'm sort of naming the partners for you, uh, and they sort of need to look at that business plan. And there is money available. And they might have some money. It's a mundane question. It's so fascinating. Bill, open door or close door for this person to get in with? So do you want me to lock it or unlock it? Um, leave it unlocked. Night, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for timing, um, we've got time because the grant window is not going to open again until you know, next year. So there's plenty of time to do this. We know that this Magellan, that things are going to happen now in Vermont. We monitor the policy and legal environment. We see what we're doing. We're delighted about the communication union district role. Uh, we're very happy about the bills that are being introduced in the legislature, and we know there's going to be federal funding again next year. And we think the reconnect program is going to continue next year. We don't think it's going to be just a pilot go away. 
Uh, we offered to send this to Mike earlier today, and we're going to send this to you. We've done an analysis of the farm bill, and we're going to get it again so that you can see where the cost of money are. And that'll just be a, a gift. Uh, but we want to be associated with what you're doing because we think it's going to turn into something big. So we're willing to provide what advice that we can until you can find funding for a plan. And we're willing to try to help you find that funding. Um, but then once it starts, we would want to be retained. Um, I think that WEC would want to have, they probably want to have their own feasibility study, even though I think you guys probably already know what's feasible and they do do all the others. But they probably want to have their own feasibility study. They probably want their own uh, gap analysis and inventory and all of that. And if they do, we're happy to do that. That raises the cost of our engagement. If we can work with you and take what we already know collectively, we can go ahead and start the business plan. So our process would be uh, feasibility study, market assessment, we do surveys. We actually do online and paper surveys. We do stakeholder engagement. We go out and talk with key anchor institutions who you would call them anchor tenants. Uh, for example, if the 16 or 17 municipalities could agree to buy a service that would be, you know, a, a, an attraction for a business plan for investors. So we would do all of those things, and then we would, like, test the adoption level. We'd look at the demographics. Uh, what's the income level? What's the age level? Because that's going to affect your adoption rates. We factor all of those things in. We look at the best way to phase the network. So we're talking about 17 communities, but what might be talking about more than that because they serve 41. And so. We've got to look at phasing, how we can generate free cash flow the fastest, how we can leverage what the partners already have, what the partnership development comes after the business model. Then you start looking at a partnership agreement. And we do partnership development all the time, so we've got agreements in place that lay out who's going to do what and what they're all going to get out of it. We have one right now for um, a Newport, Tennessee, which is an electric city in another area that looks like this. It, uh, it has the same kind of demographic, except they're persistent poverty. Uh, we did their business plan. They actually got a smart grid loan from our US, which is amazing because they're not a co-op. And we had to get our US to agree to let them pledge revenue instead of assets, which they did do. So they were able to borrow $35 million. The network only cost $21 million. And that was for two counties plus part of two other counties. They have a big serving area. It was only 21.7 million, but they went ahead and borrowed 35 because the money was very low cost. Um, our U.S. money compared to municipal bonds when I ran the numbers, the savings on the debt service was 11 million dollars. And for a startup venture, that's really good money. So we do the business modeling. We start talking with developers partnerships, we work out the terms of the engagement, we help with the contracting piece. Then, if you'd like, we will do the application for the funding. We're very successful at that. Um, I personally, I have never had an application not funded except one, and that's because the client wouldn't take my advice on the financial presentation. But everything I've ever written has been funded because, not because I'm a great writer, but because we had good plans in place. All of that work was done in advance, so I had something to go on. So we would do the application development. If the funds are awarded, and especially if it's a grant fund, there's going to be due diligence. The funders will come on site and say, OK, we've got questions, because they're going to try to reduce their risk. They're going to ask for things like sensitivity analysis, or a break-even plan, or a risk mitigation strategy. We know how to do those. So we would represent you during due diligence. Um, and if you like, you can retain us to do the design engineering and your construction management. We do not do design build. We don't recommend it. And our US will not allow it. The engineer has to be separate from the construction company. So we would go in and be the construction manager. We would manage all of the procurement because we know what things should cost. Uh, we would manage all of the contract administration, and we would manage the compliance for you until the project is complete. Then we would conduct the final inspection and close it out with the funders. So that's us for 60 minutes.
So that all sounds fantastic. It sounds very expensive. And the question is, um, we can do this out of paradise, and, yes. and, but we don't need to accept all the services. <coughs> We'll give you a menu to pick from, and we do realize that you guys are just getting off the ground. We also know that we want to be part of what's happening in the box. It's going to be good. And um, so we're willing to come in and accept research from you instead of charging you more so we can do some research and community engagement. That's what you guys are for. And uh, we can go straight to the business plan, and the business plan will be a go, no-go step. So what comes out of the business plan will dictate whether you go forward. So we're willing to end our engagement after the business plan it does not make sense or it wouldn't make sense to a partner. Um, and we will try to keep that price low. If you ask me for a range of prices and I'm on camera, I'm going to give you one. But it's to be determined. We think that we could do it for between fifty and eighty-eight thousand dollars, but we would face it so that you would not have to pay all of those funds up front. And the scope is going to dictate the price total. So the more you can do, and we're going to allow you to do it because we know people are in this group, we know you're confident, and we know you have the expertise, so we would trust your information. So that could lower your price. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah. I seem to think there's something special about what could happen here. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious where you think that is. Well, <laughs> well remember, we work in all 50 states, and so we see the bad things that happen. And, uh, for example, in my state, municipalities can no longer build networks. Mm. Rural electric co-ops can offer telecommunication service, but they're not allowed to seek our U.S. funding and pay for it. So, you know, and these things change all the time. But we see um, a change in leadership in the state. The politics have changed. We've been monitoring the communications used to be in the district formation, which is really good. Um, we like public utility districts. And we think that you're going to have some laws that are going to be, that are going to accelerate broadband instead of decelerating broadband as we've seen in 21 states. So for the remaining states that have good laws, we like to work with them while you still can. Essentially. We think there's a lot of pent up demand too. So. There's a uh, Department of Agriculture business development plan that's open now for planning and close the requirements on the end of the month, end of March. How would working with you potentially fit into that? Because I, I think that in, in, in order to put the application together for that grant, you have to be very specific about who's going to do what. You almost have to have the scope of work in the grant. I'm sure you can spend it. And actually, it's targeted for rural businesses. How they're going to support them. Yeah. Right. So they want to know how many jobs and, and that kind of thing. Well, that is a rural business. <laughs> so, you know, uh, some technical assistance for them. If we have questions, anytime you do employment, you're going to create jobs. And what about the timing for getting that grant? Time is tight. Yeah, that is tight. It's very tight. I don't really know if it's going to be honest. You can try. Well, you're talking about just the planning grant, Jerry. Yeah, yeah the planning grant that closes the sixty thousand dollar pot yeah. of money. No matter what you write, excuse me. No matter what you write in the plan, even if this is not successful, you're going to be using it, the material over and over again to get money. So. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> because we'll go back to the business plan. Um, <clears throat> once you do the business plan, once you do the partnership development piece, if you go after a grant and turn down, it doesn't matter. You just keep going. The first time you get a grant, you're going to get a lot more grants. The first money in is the hardest to raise because you're <coughs> going to know. But once the federal government lends money or grants money, they like to leverage what they've already spent. So if they don't have to recreate the wheel, they can just put a few more dollars into something they've already funded. 
uh, Scott County Telephone in Virginia is a good example. They've got three community connect grants because our U.S. <coughs> likes to leverage what we've done. So the first money in is going to be hard, but once you get it, you'll see a lot more grants and grants. Grants, particularly. Can I stay, stay on, the, on that same theme again? about the timing and the tightness of the timing. Would it be possible, and, and if, if we were to work with you, would it be possible to work that into the application for this grant that's coming, that, that the deadline is the end of March? Um, is that, would that, would that be, is that a feasible way to pay for this kind of work if we were to move forward that quickly? You mean if we were just to do that and you pay us for the grant proceeds or you would retain us and write the grant? Or? Oh, I, was, I wasn't thinking of retaining you to write the grant because we don't have any money to retain. So uh, if I can maybe re reframe it maybe. So, so I think what Jerry's asking is if we, if we said that Magellan was going to be the group that we are going to engage to do the planning, no, not have you write the grant, I think we will be able to do that in, in collaboration with the local USDA off, right. RD office. Um, but, but they said, yeah, that there's, there's two approaches. You either have the consultant that you're going to work with in your pocket, already essentially set, ready to go, or you're ready to, to shoot out an RFP that's already essentially built that's part of that grant application. That, that's what you're talking about, right? Right, right. right. <clears throat> yeah, so, so I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that Magellan really would have much to do other than, you know, um, pr maybe provide some information that would be necessary to put their information on, on the grant. Which is which is something I, I think we should probably talk about more uh, dur also, during the USDA reports back bit. We also monitor funding opportunities. We do that all the time with the appropriations bills. And so one of the things that we could do would be keep you informed when there are opportunities open. So maybe on this point, you said it's too tight, kind of too too late to go for that. But if, if, if what we're going for is a planning grant. Taking a completely different tangent, we we're talking. You talked about a rural community in Tennessee, was it Newport that you said? Yes. That um, that is a poor community. Yes. Um, has there been? Is, do they have the broadband in place now? Yes. And has there been any examination of? Has this helped improve the lives of the poorer members of the community? Have some of them been able to say find online jobs? Yes. And, and online so the, uh, classes and certification. You know, this is one of the things we discovered when we started doing grants research for Newport. Because sometimes people don't know what's going on in their own community, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we actually go and read newspapers and things. And one of the things we found out was that Newport, Tennessee, is the third worst city in the country for opioid abuse-related health problems. Nobody that we talked to, either, but you know, um, and so these are uh, addiction problems. If you live out in a rural area 30 miles from town, you're an addict, you don't have a job, you don't have money, it's kind of hard to get counseling. <laughs> but if you have a broadband connection, you can get counseling. <laughs> the same thing is true for suicide prevention. So yeah, there's already some um, some addiction treatment programs going on around the broadband. I was also thinking more specifically about jobs in, in my in my town of Orange, I think, um, the, the idea that there are jobs out there that they could get if they had, 
Like I just had a friend in Alabama who just got hired to do tech support online. She has to have a good connection. Um, but it's going to lift her out of a really bad situation now that she's got this job. You know, I don't think they've done research yet to know. I mean, obviously, it is, and obviously, it's going to make a huge difference. But I can tell you that from my community, it's made a huge difference. But I will also say that sometimes the benefits to the community in terms of economic development and jobs lag deployment of the network. Because there has to be a period of time for people to understand how to use it to get jobs and how to improve their businesses. And so some adoption programs by the communities, uh, training programs can be great. We've seen a big lag, but in my community, we have we have fiber to hunt. You know, I could not do what I do for Magellan, and I would not do what I do for Magellan if I had to go to the office in Florida or Denver. Um, but because of what we, we have 40 consultants across the U.S. and we talk to each other and work online every day. We use GoToMeeting, we use uh, online collaboration tools. It's a great thing for Magellan because we can talk to a peer expert in any area at any time and share information. Um, we also work with our clients using Basecamp, which is just great. We can share documents in real time, we have GoToMeetings. So it's been great for our business, it's been great for our community. Uh, we have a lot of people now who are working from home. And when we did our first survey, we wisely left an open comment at the bottom. Please share any concerns that you have about the existing budget. And the comments were unbelievable. They were like, I used to live in a third world country and they had better internet than I have here. And if I don't get my internet, I am going to lose my job. One girl said that she had failed an exam because the internet line dropped and the school wouldn't have her in her bank. <laughs> We, we heard from a lot of people that they were going to lose their job if they couldn't get their internet connection. So those weren't new jobs, but they were jobs saved. But there is a lag, there is a lag, a lag period, and you need to be prepared to understand. But we might be able to offset some of that with community yeah. organized community effort and training and, and outreach. Mm -hmm. That's very important. And we actually talked to a co-op down in North Georgia Years ago, we worked together with the years ago, so I called him one day because he was having some spare time. And I said, you know, he's in the economic development piece for the cooperative. And I was like, you guys have a lot of economic development since you put the network in, which has been almost eight years. I said, how has this affected your ability to recruit businesses in the area? He said, we've had three in eight years. But he said, really, the biggest impact has been on home based businesses and remote workers. They haven't recruited a lot more. Than, and sometimes economic developers don't know how to recruit. They're used to doing things based on state directives. They're used to big box, you know, try to bring in the white elephant. That doesn't work anymore. And so they kind of need some help because they don't understand how to market what they've got. And we have actually been retained to do that. A uh, tribe that we raised money for came back and said, we need for you to tell us what industries we should be recruiting from and exactly who we should call. Uh, and so we did do that. We did some business research, working with the university, and gave them a complete list. Some of the industries were not a good fit because, you know, they, their tourism, they don't want to mess up their views or their water or media. For the high tech, which is an enormous uh, industry with lots of subsectors, we were able to give them a great list with contact information and strategies for why the companies would want to work there. One of them was bank. And, you know, uh, said so the tribe carried tax credits, a $10,000 per tribal employee tax credit uh, to anyone hired on the tribal lands. They connect directly to Atlanta on, they own their own pipe to Atlanta. And so they could recruit back office jobs for banks, clearing houses, um, into the area and retain local people and get a tax credit bundled up with the free internet access over their network. One more question. That was about, sorry. No, please. I've gone to your website and I've just signed up for the newsletter. Okay. What information and news am I going to get? Since that's what we get in the newsletter. What's going on? Information about funding opportunities, uh, information about smart city applications, which is a 
big deal for us. Uh, press releases about our projects. <laughs> um, federal information, a uh, big deal for our uh, group out in California right now is wireless tower siting. Uh, it's a big fight going on where the cellular industry is trying to restrict what cities charge for access to their poles. Um, and they're going state by state. They've already been in our state. They tried to say you can only charge $20 for the poles. They actually tried to set the price. So that was defeated. But there are all sorts of things that cities have to do now when some of the projects are for the poles. So we, we publish information about current policy and what's happening. So both of our projects have the policy issues. Yes, and funding opportunities. Sounds like we're, we might be out of questions. We have about uh, seven minutes of parting comments if you have any, otherwise. Well, um, just from a personal standpoint, I'm pretty interested in working with the as a whole. You guys seem to be pretty progressive people, which I like. Um, you find a way to do things without having a lot to work with. You're very innovative. And, um, one question here, because you're going to deal with a lot of municipalities in Vermont. You to work in Vermont. Yeah. So I, you, you deal directly with municipalities yes. and you're used to working with the municipal yes. statutes and all that. Yes, and cooperatives and public utility districts and states. Most of our, our clients are nonprofits and public entities. We don't do work for Verizon and the University of Hades. <laughs> because, you know, we're creating. We, we tried to work, but we got a project in Savannah uh, a few years ago, and um, we do diligence <coughs> for the funders. So we send down requests so that they can tell us what they're prepared to offer uh, before the city builds fiber, just in case they want to do it for them. And um, AT&T called us, and they said, we're not going to give you any because Magellan is our competitor. So we, we don't work with them, but we do work strictly with publics and not clients. I will say that we work with small, uh, some private companies, but they tend to be smaller local groups like Kingdom, uh, like our cable company, which is a local family-owned business. But we don't work with the giant incumbents, cable or telecom. And, you know, some, some organizations that serve local communities actually incorporate these businesses rather than nonprofits for a reason. And the reason is they don't have to share their confidential information because they are going to be attacked by the industry. And so, you know, I started up a, a middle model carrier in uh, southwestern North Carolina because the investors told me they wouldn't put the money in unless we did it because <laughs> they didn't know anything about it. But, but they did have a business reason for doing it. Their core business demanded it, and they were both very wealthy. One was an Indian tribe with a casino, and the network kept going down. And, and it went down three weekends in a row while they were digging around you know, an area that didn't have, a, have diversity on the network. So it just took down all the cell phones, all the wireless, all the telephone, all the internet for a four county area went down, including the casino. And they wouldn't tell us how much money they lost in those three weekends. But they did say that it was in the 11 digits in three weekends. And so they were like, how much is this network going to cost? And I said, $17 million. And they were like, well, we lost that. if that fellow over there, Franklin, wants to be our partner, that's fine with us. But if he doesn't, we'll just pay for it. <laughs> because, you know. So we did. But, but we incorporated that company as a for-profit entity because we started getting flagged immediately from the lobby. And they could have uh, gotten our financial statements and you know, tax returns or published after two years if they're not profit. So we work with that kind of for profit, that kind of for profit. Very good. Thanks very much, Jerry. We Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Chris Lynch from Matrix Design Group. Hi, Chris. That's kind of a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
My name is Chris Lynch. I'm with Matrix Design Group. Uh, I did bring some brochures for people, so I'll leave them here. But cool. Pretty warm. Okay. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll stand. Uh, I'm based out of Worcester, Mass. It's a four-hour drive up, so I just want to get my legs up underneath. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Matrix Design Group. Uh, we've been in business for over 22 years. Um, we got formed to design and build fiber optic networks. That's all we do. Uh, over the past 22 plus years, we've done thousands of fiber projects and built literally thousands of miles of fiber networks. Uh, included in the projects that we've done include uh, Rutgers University, who connected all of their um, campuses in New Jersey. We built two multi-million dollar smart grids for public service in New Jersey. Uh, we recently did a seven ring fiber backbone for the city of Boston, for Verizon actually, which included a secure um, uh, link to the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, included in all that work, and I, I should back up and mention, that there's actually two companies, two sister companies, they're privately owned out of East Hanover, East Hanover, New Jersey. You have Matrix Design Group, which does the engineering, uh, and you have Millennium Communications, which does the installation and the electronics. So together we can do the design and the build, or as we like to say, take a, a project from the concept to completion. Over the years, we've also built 10 rural fiber to home networks um, in, New, in, in New England. We built the first nine towns for, for uh, uh, EC, EC fiber. Uh, we not only designed it and built it, but we operated that network for the first three years of its existence. So we put into place the building and their uh, technical support, um, pretty much everything that, that went into that network. Uh, and you know, just for full disclosure, not only did we design it and build it, but we were also an investor in it because the way that they paid for that network was basically by investors and smaller people giving uh, donations or investment that basically paid a little bit better than CD rates from the bank. Uh, we also built the town of Leverett in Massachusetts. Now Leverett was an active Ethernet network. Uh, they did a $3.6 million uh, general obligation bond, which means that the uh, average house in Leverett was valued at $275,000. They ended up paying uh, $209 per year for 20 years to pay for the network. However, it was well worth it because the take rate in town was about 84% of the homes. <laughs> and the people who took uh, internet service, of those people, 70% of those got a voice over IP line and got rid of their line from Verizon because the copper had been so bad for so many years, they were just happy to get rid of it. So the network is very, very successful. Um, and the average price when you add in the tax increase, it's about $90, uh, $95 per month. If you have a house that's worth more than $275,000, you're paying over $100 for the tax increase. But again, it's, it's well worth it. Um, Leverett actually happens to be the next town over from Amherst. So a lot of the people either work at the University of Massachusetts or they rent out an apartment to somebody that works there or goes to school there. Um, we also are in the process of building up four, uh, four towns for Burlington Telecom. Now, we weren't involved with their original build. <laughs> uh, I kind of want to make that clear. Uh, but, um, their expansion is one of the reasons why so, you know, other companies were interested in purchasing them. Um, so they, they use the expansion um, as, a, as not just a way to get new subscribers and new revenue into the, into the, uh, into the business, but as a way to um, to make their, themselves more attractive to the investors. Uh, Burlington Telecom could have picked anybody. They chose to do business with us. Uh, we also have done a lot of work for the VTA. Uh, a lot of their engineering and pole survey work has been done by us. Uh, our three largest billing customers today are Verizon, uh, AT&T, and Level 3, which is now part of CenturyLink. Those are also the three largest internet providers in the country. Again, they can do business wherever they want to, and they choose to do business with us. So outside of the industry, we're not really well known, but inside the industry, you know, we, we have a good track record and a good name. Um, 
<coughs> we're also in the process of building the town of Petersham Mass. Now, Petersham is a little bit different. It's a public-private partnership. Um, they are providing us with the right-of-way on utility poles and a place to house the power of the network electronics. We're paying to design, build, and operate the network on our own dime. Now, the reason we're able to do that is because they fit the business model that we've learned over the years. Uh, included in that business model is a lesson that we learned in FEC Fiber, that in order for you to be a break-even, you have to have six subscribers per mile of bill. Now, there's a difference between a subscriber and a house, because one house could have multiple subscribers, but you still need those six subscribers in order to just, just be at a big breaking point. So one of the big things in, you know, for you guys going forward is to try to figure out the areas that you'll be able to meet that goal. And those are the areas that you should start building out first to kind of build from there. And I also agree with something that Sherry mentioned as far as like working with the, the municipalities. <clears throat> one of the first things you might want to undertake is take a look at what they're currently paying for you know, like their uh, telephone service, but they might still have centrics. Uh, what they're paying you know, for their internet access, um, and what it would cost to put in a municipal fiber ring. Right? Because um, if you connect the municipal buildings and the schools, um, all of a sudden now you have a fiber network that's in place that can be expanded to every house that passes it. And once you, you know, uh, do that, you're able to expand the network. That revenue comes in, part of that revenue goes for network expansion, the rest of it goes for paying for operating the way you can basically self you know, grow the network out of that way. Um, the partnership with Peterson, um, give you a little background on that. By area, they're one of the largest towns in Massachusetts, but 85, excuse me, 82.5% of the town is non taxable because they're right on the Quadrant <coughs> Reservoir, so a lot of it is, is MDC land, it's, it's, you know, it's state land. And Harvard University has a school of forestry in, in Peterson. So another good chunk of the land is made up by the Harvard Forest. So they, they don't have a lot of tax money to put to this. So our partnership offer was you know, a godsend. They have a density of about 11 homes per mile, which gives us the ability to say, yeah, you know what, we're probably going to be able to get six subscribers per mile at a density of 11 homes, you know, because not everybody's going to take the service. In Leverett, where they, they might have the highest take rate in the country, the 16% the of the people who didn't take service, I know because I literally went door to door, you know, uh, helping people uh, test the service and whatever. The people who didn't take service were the people who were elderly and didn't want the technology. They were people who um, were ca uh, land rich but cash poor and couldn't afford another monthly bill. And then the third part was the people who were just on a fixed income and just couldn't flat out afford it. The bad thing about that model is that those people who couldn't afford to take it, they're still paying yeah. it on their tax yeah. So in Leverett um, and tuning in Petersham, there's no cable company, so we're not competing against the cable company. They're only got Verizon. <coughs> and we don't mind competing against DSL because we think DSL over the long run is not going to be I, I started off in business selling uh, T1s to businesses. And when pe pe businesses got T1s, they thought that's all I'm ever going to do. Hmm. One and a half <laughs> megabits. You know, let me take off some of that bit. With it. I'll, I'll put it to voice lines. You know? right. And then when people got DSL, you know, three megabits, oh, this is great. I'll never need anything else in my life. Right now, the standard is 25 down and three up. I can see that going to like 100 by 100 in a couple of years. Most of the traffic on the internet today is video, right? and the video standards are changing. So you're going from your standard definition and high definition today to 4K and 8K. Standards that use more than double the amount of bandwidth. You know, so what might work for today is not going to work in, in, in the future. And you're going to have jobs that require a lot of upload. Um, you know, some of the jobs that people don't think about that are becoming dependent upon broadband are things like machine shops, right? How can you get the CAD files to the, to the machines 
in order to, to place the order or fix the order for the customer. You can't. I've seen a lot of machine shops close because they had to move to towns that had broadband. We have veterinarian services today that they, they, you know, an animal has a problem with their eye. They, they need to upload that to a specialist to get, you know, you know, get a, uh, a recommendation or anything else like that. Anything that requires a file is an upload, and that upload is, you know, if you're in DSL, you're, you're running into problems. So uh, you're right in doing fiber. Um, you're also facing a big uphill battle because you, your main problem is money. You know, building fiber is not cheap. Um, and we work with, like I said, EC Fiber and their model of self-funding. We work with Leverage, where they did a bond offering. We work with Peter Sam, where we were basically doing a public private partnership. And you're, you're kind of sitting in a no man's land. And you kind of need to figure out how you're going to get from point A to point B. And to get from point A to point B is going to require some cash. And the question becomes, how do you get that? Now, one of the things that I won't say that we do, we're, we do engineering and we do construction. We don't do business plans, and we don't do um, grants, and we don't do applications for, for rust loans or things like that. The landscape has changed greatly over the past couple of years. A couple of years ago, when they were building EC Fiber, there was no rust loans. There was no money that was available from the USDA. Unless you were a, um, uh, a reservation west of the Mississippi, you weren't going to get any funds. Now today, some of those funds are available. So th those, are, those are avenues that you might be able to use to get funding. But again, there's other competition that you'd be looking at, like a VTEL or, or other folks who might be going for those same funds. And some of the, some of the conditions that they put on those funds are, are unfair. Like, for example, if the consolidated says, uh, you know, one out of every hundred homes in your town can get ten up, ten down. Guess what? That's served. You know, even if that one person they say can get that ten up, ten down, can't get it. As long as it says so on their map, they're not considered a unserved uh, census census uh, block. So the big thing going forward with you guys is trying to figure out how do you get the project off the ground. We do engineering. Uh, we're willing to be a sounding board for you. If you have any, you know, because we run into a lot of different aspects and projects, we, we might have seen something that you run into before. And the one example that I'll give you, and, you know, since I've been so pessimistic, <laughs> um, is the example of the town of Concord, Massachusetts. Um, Concord, Massachusetts has both Verizon Fios and they have Comcast. Yet they've started a municipal broadband that has been really successful. Because one of the problems that you run into trying to overbuild a Comcast or another cable provider is when you talk to people, they'll say, yeah, I can't stand them, I can't wait to change. But when push comes to shove and it's time for them to sign up for service and cut the cord with, with their cable provider, most people don't do it. I, uh, well, you know, they just don't. Or, on the flip side, the cable company will come back when you, when you call to cancel. So, are you sure? Because we'll give you a special deal. <laughs> and they make it really hard for you to cancel. And, and your, your tape rate that you're counting on starts to go down. Um, as, a, as a point of interest, we haven't built the network in Peterson, but right now we have a tape rate of 70%. Because people who only have DSL, they, they want something better. And going forward, it, it, it's not just a, a right, it's a public utility that unless you have that broadband available, people are going to move away. New families with children aren't going to move in. The, the population of the towns is going to get older and older and older. And then school districts aren't going to get any cheaper to run. You know, so it's it's one of these things that's it's it's critical now, and it, it's it's only going to get worse. So you're doing the right thing by trying to address it today. Um, and as I mentioned before, as far as the town of Concord, they've been really successful. But the one thing that they had going for them, they were in a, a municipal light department, which means that they were the electric company of the town. 
So they had the ability, they, they already had every single house in, in town on their billing system, connected <laughs> to the electric service. All they had to do was run fiber uh, and then connect the houses. They started off by connecting the municipal buildings and the electric substations for the electric department. And then they started growing out from there. And by doing that, you know, they've been very, very successful. Even though they're competing against Verizon Files and against Comcast. So, about um, two minutes if there's any, any questions yep. for Chris. We got about or two minutes to wrap up if you don't, nobody has any questions for you. Since you're on the construction <coughs> side of things, how, how difficult it is, or going forward, knowing the number of places that are going to start doing this, getting employees or skilled labor to do construction, installation, and maintenance? Um, you're starting to see a lot of colleges and, and junior colleges have programs in, in splicing. For, you know, so you're going to start to see a lot of people joining the workforce for this particular job. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those great jobs, like being a welder or, or, or any any trade that's transferable. So you can decide that, yeah, listen, I'm starting off in Vermont, um, but there's a lot of jobs that are in Florida or in California, and you can take your your, your experience and bring it with you wherever you go. So um, those things are not going to be a problem. When you're doing things with, with public funds, one of your problems that you run into is prevailing wage and all the paperwork that goes along with that you know so it's not really our splicers we're you know we're we're a, a union shop um, so all of our splicers are making actually more than prevailing wage and well, what kills a project as far as like the, the costs associated with it it's all the paperwork that goes along with it you know so that would be one one problem I think that you run into as far as the and the other problem that you run into is it's not thought of a lot is the maintenance because the utility companies, there's, there's only X number of subcontractors out there, and all the utility companies use this, right? So their big contracts are, are going to be with Consolidated and with others, and if there's a big storm, they're the people who are going to get served first. Now, the way that utility poles work anyway is it's the electric company goes first, the telephone company goes second, then anybody who's attached to the poles goes third. Even if you're the first person on the scene, you have to wait for the other two to take care of their issues. So it's it's little things like that that kind of you know add up. Good information. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate well, it coming. Thank you. Um, happy to leave some cards too if anybody needs a card. I I take a card. And these are some extras for you. Okay. You want to? Anyone need a card? Sure. They give me a pack of a thousand, so. Is your bonus calculated on how many of the thousand? No, and I'm not. That? I'm not on commission, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could honestly tell you that. Um, I ran out. I ran out. <laughs> I apologize. I can honestly tell you that I've been in, in technology for um, geez, over 25 years, and Matrix is the best company I've ever worked for, you know, and that's just the people involved. So. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Business Development Committee report back. I believe that's you, Jerry. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off. Yeah. Uh, first thing I want to say is Elliot was... Uh, I don't know why he's not here, but Elliot was going to talk about the website okay. that, that he's been working on and different things that, that he's been doing, and I cannot speak for him, uh, but that was his intention for, for well, for the, for the regularly scheduled. Mm -hmm. So we have, Ken, you, you, you're ready to talk today, right? I can talk a little, sure. Okay, and David, you'll want to talk about yep. the survey and what you're doing? So either one, guys, whoever wants to start, go for it. I'll start. Um, so the proposal that went in under the innovation grant, um, that piece of legislation is it has been drafted to fund specifically that grant. Um, probably won't um, be available until July 1st. Um, but I, I'm getting the sense that that legislation is really going along quite well. So, so that's part A. Um, and then part B is the Northern Border Regional Commission. Um, the 
letter of intent to seek funding is due in the March. The actual, but it really is just a letter. There's no format that requires a, a lot of detail. Um, the proposal itself is due sometime in May. Um, and so that's for up to a quarter million. And I'm pretty aware of the criteria for that, for that grant program. And is, is, that, is that a construction grant? It is an infrastructure grant. Okay. So that's, what, that's, what it, that's where you have the greatest opportunity for success, is as infrastructure. Okay. Um, and you get about two years. If indeed you apply and are accept, you get accepted at the end of the summer, about August, and then you have two years to use the funds. Um, and then, um, then getting back to the legislation, um, there's some planning funds available for um, entities like communications union districts at about I think sixty thousand a pop. I mean, yeah, like 60, 60, 60, 60, 60. yeah, sixty thousand a pop. Uh, but then the big one is the bond um, package through a VITA, VITA bond, um, several millions of dollars, where in terms of appropriation, the, the, the proposal is to put in some loan loss so that VITA is more comfortable um, taking on a little bit more risk. Um, and again, all this is within a uh, current draft on the bus telecommunications bill. Um, again, the early, the early reviews are very solid. This is a topic that the legislature and the administration are um, aligned on, which, which is great. <laughs> so, let's go. Okay. So the uh, I think I sent everyone a copy of uh, the proposed survey to go out. I do like the question of add, adding a, adding the one with throwing your own comment. I don't have that in there right now. Um, I've gotten some great <coughs> edits and corrections that I've made some of them already. Um, but I, I didn't hear from everybody. I think I heard from about six people, seven people. How many people have done the survey? Oh, more. oh great. I haven't gone into the database to see the answers, but um, well, that's great. I, um, you send that out. I don't have your email yeah. address, so you didn't get it. But I may perhaps somebody else commented on, it, on your survey, but I was wondering, you didn't make there about fit, uh, businesses. It all seems to be aimed towards residential users. Right. A, a new version would have to be done, or, you know, a separate set of questions for businesses. Um, I did have a meeting with the Economic Development Corporation person from Montpelier who is really interested in, she said, is a big interest among small businesses in Montpelier who don't have money to buy first light or, or, or the, the ma major connections in it. And she was willing to actually do the survey for them in Montpelier. So I thought that was good news. And I haven't reached out to the other economic development. Yeah, you know, Barry has one, I know. I, I don't know, Northfield must have one or not. They, 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 yeah. they do indeed. I've actually heard, and I heard last so. year from, from the folks in, in Barry um, that, that they're, you know, they're a business group there. They, they would like to see fiber there as well so. for similar reasons. So and I like <laughs> the other question of surveying the municipalities to see how much they spend right now on telephone, internet, whatever. But that'd be a little different. Um, I did, uh, in terms that, I think I'll leave that for the business well, development. I've been trying to get the map for rural development, and I can't. Um, there was, at one point, talk of getting some input from WEC about questions they would like asked in the survey. So I sent it to Bill Powell, and he sent it to Carol Monroe from EC, from Bellingham. <laughs> and she, had, she actually gave me three good edits. Okay. Nothing really related to WEC came back, so I don't, you know. I still want to reach out again on that. I do have, because like, I haven't had time to look at it, and I'm sorry mm -hmm. about that. Um, you're talking about the development people and a separate business thing. Is that is there anything in the survey that's going to the residential areas that will cover people who have own businesses that are not necessarily hooked in? Add that. All of these other things, like like my uh, business, my right? neighbor uphill runs. Uh, yeah. trucking. Good thing. So I just didn't know. That's not in there. Because I know that they're dying for internet and they can't get DSO to move the right up the hill. So. Do you want to copy that survey, Barry? As you yeah, guys are looking at it. Bill's application this week, but yeah, David, if you send it to yep. me, that would be great. 
The edited version, please. Yeah, no, it's, it's, every time somebody sent that, I updated it. So you may have gotten one that was already pretty good. <laughs> when you did, when you got the one that you can only check Worcester, no, I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Worcester had a lot of takers. <laughs> But that's sort of where I'm at, and uh, I basically, I don't have much else. I did, I mean, I already report on the, I held a community meeting in Calus last week in which eight people came to me. It was in competing with the Washington Central. <laughs> Difficult, I mean, I know it was about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a boxing match. I did, I did, uh, I did ask if I, the people who came were willing to go around and do host-to-host -host surveys, and I all said yes. So I felt pretty good about that. That's good. Excellent. Jeremy, can I just ask a question that, in terms of the, your survey, how are you going to get it out? Who's it? You know, what, yes. what are you looking for for distribution? I think you know one of the the I've been thinking of using Front Porch Forum as a first first ring, but first go round. But I think it really is going door to door. Or every as Michael is suggesting, every sixth door, and you actually have the people fill it in as you go to the door. As you get a chance to explain what it is, because I still have a sense most people in most communities don't even know what the heck we're doing. Is it a public entity? Is it a community business? You know, and what, what does it mean to me? So then, then the, that begs the question: How we recruit survey takers? Because one guy is not going to do that. No. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know how much engaged you are with your own community, but it's 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 a bit of work. Um, mm -hmm. Some of you are still working full time. Me, you know, I work part time. Could do lots of things. But but we could conceivably, if, it, if we do end up, end up going to a partnership, we could conceivably put that out with the co-op currents. True. Possible. I don't know how long long it is, but there's yes. There's or, or but uh, but we have a link to. It's a oh, link, I don't, yeah, on the web. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Print one. I haven't done a printed one of it, but certainly. I was saying, do, you know, if you went door to door, it would be on a note, on a tablet, so you'd actually you know, like Mike, Michael's broken a lot of ground here. He has a tablet. Fill it in. <laughs> no paper. <laughs> I was wondering if there was a way to do it, like you know, for my viral version where. Think about like my daycare and stuff where I have the email list for who parents go to our daycare. Like, there's just a lot of different connections there. It's my wife's office. And, like, no, I mean, I'm looking, brainstorming this would be great. So, you got but ideas. You just have to be careful of if you're doing a survey, it's not to have. Yes, yeah, you're bringing bias if you start doing it. Well, or no, just having people filling it out a number of times with different connections or whatever. Well, we're asking them for the 911 address. So okay. if they give us the same address, then, then if we can easily can duplicate that. Okay. Yeah. okay. Anything? Uh, any questions for business development folks? Okay. Moving along, we have a bunch of other um, reports back, and uh, very. I don't, if you want to keep sitting there, that's that's fine. Um, we are going to talk about WEC momentarily. If, if you want to join us more in the kind of the circle here, but I'm happy to if you want. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to take the fifth, but don't worry about it. All right. <laughs> so WEC, State House, and USDA reports back. We've had meetings, um, several meetings in different forums with all of these, with all of these groups. Um, but Barry's here from WEC, and uh, if you want to maybe introduce yourself, and if you want to give us a, like a snapshot of where you guys are all thinking and the decision from the board or whatever, that's not all of that is necessarily percolated back to everyone here. Okay. Um, I'm Barry Bernstein, I'm president of the board of Washington Electric Co-op, have been for a number of years. Um, I'll just say that I really got more interested in this within the last 60 days, really. I know you guys have been doing it for longer. Um, I have run a business out of my home, and when I had dial-up, which was only five years ago or something like that, I actually had to tell people they couldn't send me stuff. They have sent it to another address. But so I understand that our biggest thing is we have eight members a mile. So the real question is in a fairly elderly population, you know, what numbers are, are um, going to make sense? Um, after I'm, I met with Jeremy and a few folks, at the end of January, our board voted to go ahead and try to find grant money uh, to do a. a a needs assessment, feasibility study, and business plan. Michael won't let me say this separately, so I'm going to say it together. Um, but we, we can't, cry. at this point, we can't use any electric money to do anything for, for fiber. That's a state statute, and although it may be changed, 
we have a lot of requirements not to cross subsidize with electric users who really might not want the service. So we've got to be fairly careful with that. We took we've taken a look at the at the thirty thousand dollar grant. Our concern is is the amount of energy to putting it all together. It's not so much writing the, the first four or five pages. It's all the documents mm -hmm. that they require on top they of that. They ask for a lot of documentation. And when you're an electric co-op that's just going to be celebrating our 80th anniversary this May, uh, we have, I mean, you know, our audits aren't just one page, and if you need two or three years of each thing. Um, so um, Patty Richards, uh, our manager, and I testified in front of the House Energy Committee on H95 and I actually threw out the idea that maybe they wanted to put $75,000 in for uh, our co-op, so, because they were going to get the DPS, their, their plan is to get DPS to do a state needs assessment of all utilities and other providers, and I could see that being nothing but a mess. Um, Michael's been working with them, and I guess that they're, that's, they're talking about doing feasibility money now, that we could tap it. That would be a lot easier for us to go after it was available, then the amount of time you got to put in to get 30000 for the federal government. Uh, Sherry points out one good point that once you start getting money from anybody, it, does, it is helpful. But um, I, I'll be honest with you, we have a board meeting tomorrow and I have to do some more talking with that board. Uh, our manager is practically resistant on this um, because it's, it's a big, it's a big jump from us to move to the next step. Um, I think, I, my feeling is there's no way to go but to make the move. Um, and I've given that some thought, so uh, I'll just tell you this. Um, Patty introduced herself as the manager, and having to be practical, and I was the visionary. And afterward, I thought about, um, yes, I, my visionary is having convinced our board in 2003 to build the Coventry Landfill Gas Project, which is now supplying 70% of our electricity, and within the next couple of years, it'll be supplying 85% of our electricity. And to make our co-op 100% renewable before anybody was talking about it, which was 2007. So, you know, I'm a very pra pragmatic person when it comes to business, but I also think we, we're gonna need to make this jump. Where we're actually at, I can, I can only speak for myself, is that I've been pushing this. I think the feasibility study, if we knew the money was going to be in the state, if they pass it this year, I think our timing would be great. I think it makes a lot of sense for us to work together. I, I talked with Sherry earlier, and she asked how I felt about it, and I said, I can tell you how I feel. If I have a nine-person board, but I think that we're, there's no way we can work separately on this, to be honest with you. We have the polls. We own 100% of our polls. Um, what we want to look at, which may be a little different than you, but I think the end goal is the same. We want to look at um, what's the benefit of us going fiber through our whole substation and all of our lines before there is a drop to the house. Because if we can make some sense out of that, it may not be 100%. As Sherry said, there's nothing to show 100% uh, economic return. But we're facing, we had five, made six major storms in 2018. It's only going to, it's, every year I write in the co-op currents in the annual report that um, this is the worst year we've ever had. I'm getting tired of it. I, I, I knew my mother was the only one who ever read those, so I didn't mind. <laughs> but I'm getting tired of keep saying the next year is the worst we've ever had. But we all know what's happening with climate change. Um, so that's... That's, in a nutshell, I'm, I'm pushing for us to look after the money. It's very hard for us, I think. I'm not sure I can push us to go after the $30,000 grant, particularly for if I, if I know there's other funds. We have looked to other funds, but they either have to, uh, we talked to V-Light, um, it has to be in line and mentioned in the comprehensive energy plan, which fiber isn't, even though you need it in order to do things. You know, there's always some little glitch. So. I think in the next, uh, by Thursday, I'll know more of where our board is, and I think it's, uh, I think people will come along. I just think we need to be patient. You guys, 
have been pushing our, and our past your patience, I, I'm, I'm trying to get us into a place where uh, we're ready to move with it. So I think, I think there's good prospects. You know, you may have to move faster than us, but I think it's probably wise for us to move somewhat in, in conjunction with each other. That's my personal perspective. Well, one of the things we, that we had talked about was the, the, the possibility of working with WEC and having them actually apply for that $30,000 just to bring you on the move. Yeah. Apply for that $30,000 planning grant with us taking the, the proceeds from the grant that we're going to get from the state to do the planning and the business plan that we had um, from the Think for My Innovation grant, which is mm -hmm. still wherever that is, mm -hmm. <coughs> and essentially hand it to them to act as the match. And that, so they would have 25000 and then get 30000 But you have to have a match, and we can't use electric money for that match. Right. So to, to take it, essentially, us and them arm in arm going in, applying for, for that USDA money, and then having $55,000 and be able to go and do work with somebody to go and build mm -hmm. Um, a business plan, do this, doing the survey and some of the other bits and pieces necessary to go and get that shovel ready stuff that you could then apply for the USDA, um, you know, re reconnect and whatever. Those those grants you need to basically be ready to go, and then as soon as they write you the check, then then you're out the door and doing construction and engineering and stuff. So the current iteration of the Omnibus Telecom Bill that Ken was mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, Earmarks um, two separate fifty thousand dollar grants for electric companies yeah. for planning. Yeah, so but but that's that, different than feasibility. <clears throat> when you were testifying, the language in one of those sets is to talk about the feasibility of electric utilities using their transmission and distribution infrastructure as a telecommunications piece, which is that yeah, that was a separate yeah. separate. Well, group is there any value in that? In I mean, no. Right. So, but, 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 this, but separately in the, the grant to the DPS, which is seven hundred thousand, right. one hundred thousand of it is earmarked for two yeah. feasibility studies for electric companies, right. separate from that other part. Right. So let's get rid of the first one. Possibly. The first one was H ninety five, I think. Is that what you're yeah. talking? So, yeah. So it's it, they've combined them all now. They're both That's in, what Michael both in there. Talked yeah. to, talk about it, but Michael, is it fifty thousand or sixty for the feasibility study? For the electric companies, it's fifty. Okay. Well, we're not a company, we're a co-op, so that's worth an extra 10, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the thing is, my feeling is, because, and we have to talk about this, um, whereas anybody who's doing a feasibility business plan might be between 50 and 75, I don't think we can do it alone by going after one of the grants. I think a combination of both of us together, we serve, you know, we have 11,000 households in 41 towns, uh, in all of your 17 towns, I believe, but maybe only a few in some, like Northfield. I don't know how many we actually have in Northfield. So um, how we get to the, the main pavement and all of those, but I don't know that they'd be our first target because they already have the services. So the ones we're trying to get, it, it's all of us who don't live. <laughs> On, on the 14 or 12 or whatever the numbers are, 302. Um, so I, you'll, I think you were going to try to consider whether it's for this $30,000 grant or more, really more advantageous for us is to be able to get the 50000 is to be able to sit down together and be able to hopefully figure out what we want out of the feasibility that gives it to all of us. Mm -hmm. Your end goal, more than, more than the electric co-op, uh, is 100% to bring fiber to every household. Our goal is to make sure that our members are getting the services that they need. And we're starting, and this is happening, I'm on the National Rural Electrification Board as a director from Vermont. This happened all over the country with 1,000 co-ops. We're all in that place where we know that um, our uh, kilowatt hour sales is flat or declining and we have a base that we've served for 80 years and we want to be current with those people going forward with our members of which I'm one as many of you are also. So. I was wondering um, what are the objections to this that come up in say in your board meetings? What well the big, I think the biggest problem we, we have is I, I'd say there are a couple. One is that we can't cro use any money to cross subsidize. Okay, so that, that puts us in, in, a, in a bind right off the bat. In fact, 
the way that the state statute is right now, which was developed in 1999 to keep us out of uh, selling propane and, uh, and, and being in that business, oil propane, is that you can't, if you can't even use RUS grants or loans uh, for non-electrics, electric utility. Things. So that's number one. I think that the, the pressing one is that we have eight members a mile. Um, we have two thirds of our members have been on the line for 40 years, 30, 40, 50 years or more. Most of us are older. And the question is how many of, uh, how many of those folks, this is a big take rate, this is a conversation that happened with Jeremy and Michael. And I gotta tell you, I didn't know what any of these words meant 60 years ago. So if I sound like an expert, I'm a bullshit, but that's, I'm learning, I'm learning really a lot faster than you guys know. I mean, I'm, tr I'm trying to catch up to speed. But, you know, if we have half, two thirds of our members who are low income, particularly in Orange County, low income and older, um, you don't think of them as wanting to get to pay. Uh, EC Fiber said that they're charging $75 a month. I'm paying $60 for seven, what is it, Michael? What do I get? Seven, two, seven, or seven, three? Seven, seven, seven three. three? Yeah. I, uh, I don't know if I get that I or not. I doubt it, but that's what they, that's what they tell me. But yeah. for $60, I get that in North American phone service. So if you're going to come in, if we're going to come in and say, I'll charge you $75, uh, as a guy who's just closing his business, it's, it's not that attractive. But when the two other folks are up here say, <laughs> if I think that, that video I want to stream is coming into me at the same speed it, it did today, in six months or a year, I'm going to be awfully disappointed when I want to watch that sporting, sporting event, which is probably all I use the streaming for. So, but that's the, that our concern is not to get in a hole where we're, you know, having to declare bankruptcy. I can understand that, but younger people got to move somewhere that they can afford to move. No, I don't think anybody, I think everybody understands that. That's, we're going through a push and pull now, you know, we're going through, you're talking about a, a board that has bought into very progressive positions way before, and this is just a new one that we got to face. And I'm, I'm balancing everything, including my own resistance to trying to get people to make that next move. And it's it's coming. You had a question. Yeah. I, first off, as a member of Washington Electric Co-op, I think working with this organization is a fantastic thing to do. And I, I, and I encourage it, and by the way, um, my real question here, though, you were talking yeah. about, you know, the, the low number of houses per mile, uh, the relative poverty rate out there and whether or not people can take, but one of the other ideas that is out there to, is to start where they, they talk about a ring and you set it up with the municipalities or, or you know the municipalities the school districts etc mm -hmm. and I, I know even in Williamstown I, I've talked to two different business owners who are extremely interested in this project so I, I mean is Washington Electric as a co-op as an organization itself are you guys focused on being able to provide service out into the houses themselves, or are you also interested in maybe starting on something that would develop, well, we heard the ring strategy laid out before. You you lay out a ring and then you build out. I don't wear one, so I don't. Uh, I don't either. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I don't think we know. That's why I've been pushing for us to do this feasibility and business plan. I don't think we know what we want to do. I think the value we bring is we own and I agree with your statement about it would be great for us all to work together. I know a number of people here. Uh, I think the, the value we bring is owning all of our own poles. I think um, if we can bring this, if we did no more than bring this to our substations all the way through our systems and not to the house, that's got to lower the cost. And we can borrow that money over 35 years. So. That's, this is just my head thinking. I've got to talk this through again tomorrow night with, with everybody. Um, and I don't think we know where we would start or not, not start. Because you may find that the density, for instance, you talk about schools. I'm not even sure our school's going to be around in two years the way they're going in this state. But the, um, 
when you talk about going in an area where there's density, like with businesses in a certain, uh, along the main line that we don't serve, there's also two or three carriers on that line. So our best may be to take, well, people in Corinth would love us, but we'd have to find some place where we don't, map, we don't connect with VTEL because we'd want to find an area where we're going to be open to getting grant and even low, lower interest loans. And we've got a, and that area, who knows where that's going to be, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be down in the villages or wherever VTEL's now already. Jeremy, you know more about where they are, but for, for David. VTEL? I mean, if you were going to pick a pilot project without knowing any more than we know now without having a feasibility. Yeah, I mean, so uh, that's, that's something I've asked to, to yeah. put together is, yeah. to, is to look at the, at the USDA um, at, at that map. Yeah. And uh, Clay Purvis from DPS actually had a, had a great um, a great term. He called them, and right in the USDA meeting, and oh, USDA yeah. was like, what are you talking about? Like, he called them contaminated yeah, census blocks. Great. <laughs> Those are census blocks that have already been partially funded by USDA rural development funds and are therefore ineligible for us to apply for any funds to build there. Um, there are decent portions of, um, of our, our territory that are not contaminated, in particular, and even up around East Montpelier, around your, your headquarters, yeah. um, makes that a, you know, a plausible place to start where we can go, but we can't really ever get rural development funds to go in, into those other areas without, um, a, without a waiver um, to fund those areas. And as we talked to USDA, they also talked about um, some, some changing mapping rules where you may be able to actually carve out um, in different ways than census blocks. Uh, they were going to get back to us on exactly what that looked like, but we had some at least some, some possibilities. Well, that. for <laughs> instance, somebody asked, and we've been in conversation with Velco, uh, if we can bring uh, the Velco, what, what's the word, Sherry, for up, uh, upstream, the upstream connection? And we can tie that to our, to, it looks like we could tie it to five of our eight substations easier than the other three because it's a longer line. But let's say we could tie it to one or two at the beginning and we could uh, identify an area within that one or two where all of a sudden picking something, we'd all have to make sense about what's the best way to go because every step we take, we want it to be a success. And we have to be very wise at doing that together. And I, again, there's not a more natural match than all in our two groups. There's just not. We, we just have to try to make sure we're all in the same place at the same time. So I welcome you, input, Alan. Uh, Barry, you, you said you can't take electric money and spend it on non-electric things. There is the community fund, is that correct? Could yeah, yeah, but that our community fund is, is, is strictly for social service, you know, for organizations that are working in the community. And we have like thirty or forty thousand dollars, but that's there would be a big opposition to because we fund a lot of very basic organizations in the community. You know, they're doing child care and and uh, uh, first like mother birth and what? Is that like hospice and things like that? We do hospice. We've done uh, Nate. What's this one that works with newborn mothers? And I mean, we're gearing to. We don't get to individual organizations and you know that are doing other stuff. So I, I would suggest that's not really a good place for us to try to I think there's some of us who are not necessarily donating our capital credits. And I'm wondering if an appeal. Why not? Well, because I think a lot of times, I think, well, rates went up this year. So you know, my bill went up, and the capital credit sort of kept it down. Uh -huh. For a brief period of time. I was only, you don't have to respond. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's true. No, I'm, I'm not embarrassed. No, uh, to say I did not donate mine. I think when an organization has a goal of doing one thing because it thinks it's important, it's not a good idea to scatter the little bit of, di dis dis uh, <clears throat> of income uh, that you can turn into a grant for one year to one organization that's going to try and work in the entire area on something that's going to be a long-lasting good. Well, let me say, as a, as a member, I'll mention at the board, I'm just saying that that's we've taken years to build that fund up. Yep, I know. And our whole message to people is it's going to small groups in our communities, libraries, and places that have a hard time getting money. So, um, you know, that's, 
that's the difficulty with that. I would say that it'd be a lot easier if Michael's work and we're testifying in front of the Senate committee tomorrow, Senate Finance, and I'll make the same pitch. Sure, me too. You're going to be testifying no, tomorrow? No, but he's done a lot of work. What's that? No, I, I, I'm not going there tomorrow. Oh, but I, you, I wasn't aware it was happening, but I've, I've been to Senate Finance already. Yeah, okay. And I, I personally probably know most of the people on that on that committee, but I, that's just what I would have pitched. This is the time for us to do it. My, my board has given us the okay to if we can find the money. And I think that's what I'm, I've been trying to do in the last, since January 27th. Not a lot. Of, in, in one month, we've got a few options that just aren't coming up exactly how we'd like them. Any other questions? I will stay in close contact. I really respect what Michael and Jeremy and all of you have done. I want to underline that immensely. I've been slow to get on the boat, but I'm there now. And I agree with my fellow co-op member over here that it would be great if, <laughs> bo if both organizations can work stronger. So thanks for your effort. Thanks Thank for you, sir. Thank you. Um, so I want to report a couple of things. Um, the efficacy and policy at the State House is probably not, um, probably not deserving of, of a separate item, um, in part because anything that we came up with tonight, it's, that ship has probably already sailed, um, with a handful of us already having testified to Senate Finance and House uh, Energy and Tech. So what, I, what I'd like to do um, is make a brief note about the, the Tilson presentation that we had previously. I talked to a uh, colleague of mine in economics who's familiar with the startup world and finance, that sort of thing, and, and sent her the presentation and uh, kind of explained what was pitched to us. And uh, she said that that's, she said that was interesting, but she did, like, didn't raise any red flags for her. She said it's just an interesting way of sort of shuffling <clears throat> the way that the financing is done. And, she, and her main, main message, and I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, her main message was just to make sure that the lawyers are happy on our side with, uh, with the agreement, just to make sure that we're not surprised if there, if there was a, a handoff, if that's a model that we, that we decided to follow. So I just want to put that out there. Um, so the Statehouse stuff, um, we've been getting invited, which is not, not uncommon, but not super common. We've been getting invited and asked to present our thoughts on various things at the Statehouse. And uh, a lot of those suggestions are being put in this omnibus bill, which is taking a whole bunch of different bills that are in uh, House Energy and, and Tech right now, and they're sort of just mashing them into one. Um, I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to walk through it fairly quickly. Um, and I want to mention the, one of the things that came out of testimony from, um, from a lot of us here was that there were a lot of, these bills had um, as set as minimum standards for state funding, they had minimum standards set at like, 4-1 and 8-1 and such. I was like, well, or 10-1, it's like, or 10 down, one up. And I said, really? It's like, so we're, we're talking about broadband now, but you're not, we're not even hitting, you know, that the national standard. And, and I advocated for, you should set it to 100-100 because that's what's already in statute. That's what it says that we're supposed to be doing by 2024. And in the current draft, they didn't go quite that far, but I managed to shove them up to 25-3. Um, I should say we managed to shove them up to 25.3, so it's it's getting better. So let me just do, I'll just do a quick walkthrough of the of what I sent you. Um, they're looking at increasing the universal service charge um, by one uh, one one half of one percent starting in July 1st, 2019, essentially to fund some of these things that they're they're talking about. Um, plowing money into the connectivity fund. And that connectivity fund is to reach the last handful of people who don't who are unserved, um, and so this is something I brought up too. The difference between um, so there's two really two goals in building a broadband in Vermont. There's getting to that last that last person up at the top of the hill, but and then there's bringing actual 21st century speeds to Vermont, which is these are two separate goals. So the connectivity fund is really targeting getting to those last people. It's less so. Um, it's less useful to us, in, in my experience. Um, it can help us like with certain legs of, of our projects, and I think that's how you've used it too, Michael, right? Yeah. To sort of like supplement designs. And, and the latest iteration is talking about 25-3 minimum for connectivity. That's, that's brand new. Mm -hmm. that's, that means no, oh. no more DSL. Okay, so anywhere that it's DSL would, would qualify them for the connectivity. No, right? no. no. 4-1 is the threshold to make it an eligible location mm -hmm. under 4-1. And if it's under 4-1, they will fund you only if you deliver up to 
My yeah. minimum is 20. Okay, three. so so <laughs> consolidated won't be able to walk in and say you're underserved. Let's run a copper wire up to you. They, and consolidated has won some of these connectivity rates right. in the past, but they won't be able to. Super. That's but, that's but exciting. Don't they say that their twin wire gives you 25.3? Yeah. That's what they, they told me. Right, but. I don't two, get it, but two, that's what two, they tell me. That's what they sold. 200 feet from the terminal. Yes. Yeah, I don't think the so, yeah. connectivity board would accept. No. Yes. Con con yeah, Consolidated can't argue that, that their twisted, twisted pair of copper is going to give you 25.3. That's what they sold me. Yeah, they're, they're, they're I mean, wrong. they, they, they you know, What's, this, what's they the speed test show you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could. Uh, 17. Well, that's, 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 that's good. Oh, it's twice it's what I had before. So ch ch channel bonded DSL, right? And supposedly each line is 8181. Eight, 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 you arguably get 16.2, but I channel bonded DSL too, and I'm lucky on a given night if I can go home and watch Netflix right now. Right. It's, I, it's well, just I can at least anymore. do that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so is yeah. the Netflix threshold going to be a statute? <laughs> <laughs> well, it should, it should be a Hulu I, I threshold. Be. Netflix is good <laughs> at adjusting yes. its speeds, yeah, but Hulu, Hulu is bad. So, I, although I, I, I do have to say, I, I did make cat video jokes <laughs> about the importance of cat videos in, in the committee meetings. So, That's, I, I think we'll get to him. Um, so, and yeah, so what's the next bit there? A uh, one-time general fund transfer. So it's $700,000, this was mentioned before, to DPS to fund feasibility and planning grants and pilot projects. So uh, 205,000 of that gets plowed into the connectivity initiative. That's in addition to that increase of the rate on July 1st. $50,000 to DPS to, uh, for doing broadband internet access using electric utility infrastructure, which we just, just talked about. Um, Think Vermont Special Innovation Fund, so fund, putting more funding into the grant pool that we just applied for, $45,000 to that. Um, let's see, another grant pool us of up to $60,000 from DPS as well to support studies and projects, um, feasibility studies again. <coughs> that's that's not necessarily tied that's the to. So, so in one part of the bill, they're appropriating it, and later they're describing how they're going to spend it. So sixty per right. Okay. Okay. So that was that seven hundred thousand dollars, and it's it's yeah. going doing more there. There, um, there's money put aside for hiring a what do they call it? Broadband. Well, in the, they call them CUD specialists, but it's, yeah. it's going to be renamed. Yeah. So yeah. So CUD specialists at at DPS to essentially help help. C new CUDs elsewhere and other folks looking at building broadband anywhere in the state, having a person who's getting paid in an office to, to do that outreach and have those questions being asked and answered immediately. To show up at select board meetings and say, hey, you want to do this? Here's how. And shepherding at all that. And that's, that was, um, I think that was really, that was Laura's vision of putting that all together. Laura Sebelius' vision, so massive. Massive kudos to her. Um, there was talk about allowing towns to um, issue general obligation bonds to fund uh, municipal broadband projects. And uh, I testified in favor. Uh, EC Fiber testified against. Um, and it, it was actually it was actually taken out. They forbid. I, uh, Williamstown would be adamant. What are you against? <laughs> so, I, I but, but 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 the, the great news is, if Williamstown doesn't want to issue general obligation bonds, they don't have to. Okay. It wouldn't pass the select board first of all, but it still has to go to a public vote. That was my argument. Yeah. It's like yeah. if the people, yeah. the select board puts it out there, and the people vote for it. Okay. It shouldn't. Right. So it did survive in the sense that they're going to study it for next year. They will study it. <laughs> so there will be some people talking about it over the summer. Which is, that's the, that's the place where ideas go to die. <laughs> do, do we know if UVM has been making any noises towards online consultation or online appointments so people in rural areas might have a shot at seeing a doctor if they have a hard time getting in? Because that could be like an expansion point. I, that's not something that, that I've heard about. I, I, I know they have medical coders that they pay rather a lot for giving them access to, um, so that they can get to the hospital network and have a fast connection and see all those documents and, right. and enter them. But I was thinking more 
an elderly person who's homebound having a difficulty getting to the doctor, mm -hmm. that could be a selling point for getting an elderly person online. That, but if that doesn't exist and there's no conversation about that, then that's not a. Uh, I just involved in telemedicine. Yeah, yeah they telemedicine. are. Telemedicine. But I think that's more the I hospital to hospital, so, or to you know, well, satellite clinics. <laughs> uh, could be. Yeah. yeah. And there are RUS telemedicine grant programs that someone like Sherry could help us hook up to. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing was the um, the bond underwriting, the state essentially insuring bonds that we ask for, I, I, that we try to, that we issue. I don't know if, if we would still have to meet eligibility requirements to to have those issued, or if we walk in with the state of Vermont saying we'll support this, if that's something that we could actually do before we have the, the financing, kind of the, the three years of audited financial, I, I, I don't know that. It's going to go through VITA, so it's mm -hmm. what VITA expects. Um, that money is really just as low and loss, so that VITA's confidence is right. Okay, so, so we would have to talk to VITA and see what they expect, so, but conceivably we could walk in there this year. Right. Um, Supposing that this existed next year. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we might. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess, well, <coughs> Tim said it. It's, it's not a bond. It's, it's loans that VITA, VITA's going to the bond market, I guess, right? And so VITA would make loans that the state is going to partially guarantee. Okay. Which is really good. So that's, uh, that's. To me, that's the. Yeah, that's the primo thing what, in the whole bill. It's what's the, the realistic? Thing. This is all getting thrown into one pot that's actually going to move this year. It's, it's, it's right now. I, I, I would bet it gets voted out of committee this week. Yeah. Cool. Is there anything anybody needs to do to help? To make sure that we when do? it gets to the Senate, yeah, it doesn't get yeah, the Senate. Yeah. So, just, I mean, are you sending Senate. emails out and, or and, something? Ann Cummings is the chair of Senate Finance, which is probably where it will land next. So it's worth it's worth talking to her. I, I think she's generally favorable. I mean, yeah. I don't. She lives in a seat in Fiberton. She does. <laughs> there we have to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a great life. It's good to say government working. Thank you so much. Um, one of the other things that it, that they add is. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, not not forcing, but um, directing um, the rules about pull attachments to be better. Uh, which is which, which is I think is going to be super helpful. So and uh, make ready. And there's a specific thing that says the rules adopted pursuant to the subsection shall specify that in the B. Here, here's the cool cool bit. If the make ready work is not completed within the applicable make ready completion period, the attaching entity, us, may hire a qualified contractor to complete the make ready work and bill it back. So if they don't go and do it, we do it for them, and we say here's how much it costs, and we walk away. So which is which is quite nice and will hopefully prevent some of the problems that Michael's seen and that EC Fiber has seen. Is that going to be fought? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That'll have you. Yeah. yeah. And, and one comment. Um, this is a belt and suspenders kind of approach. Um, it's in legislation, but at the same time, the Public Service Board has already submitted to the TUC a petition to change these make ready rules. And independent of whether it passes in the legislation, They've already petitioned the Public Utility Commission to change things. And I think that their proposal is better than the one that's in this legislation, even better. So the, the sense that I get from the folks in the State House is that, well, and actually in, even in, in the executive branch, is that people want to see this move forward. So very, very encouraging. If you're sort of like sitting here at almost exactly the right time. I mean, it'd be great if this if it was already in place, of course. But in terms of things moving forward and, and and us sitting here, I think we should feel pretty supported by our state government. It's a very uh, very exciting in, in my eyes. Um, you did see that Indiana gave a hundred million dollars to rural broadband development last week. For it. <laughs> state of Indiana did a hundred million dollar grant. Yeah. <laughs> Who'd they get that to? To, to, the, to the rural communities in, in Indiana. Nice. But anyways, it's cool. Yeah, it's good. So, um, <laughs> so but, but the other thing that's that's cool that, that I, did I, 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 I want to make sure I underscore is that the Northern Borders funding, so Northern Borders with the Farm Bill now extends to all of Vermont, and we are now eligible to apply for those as well, which is, 
which is big. Um, anything else on like state house, state policy, advocacy stuff that I'm missing, Michael or, or David for that matter? You've been there, yeah. So what's what's on the what's on the docket for Senate Finance tomorrow then? I don't know, but Barry's going. Okay. So maybe he knows. I can I can pull up their, their schedules. Do you, do you know offhand, Barry? I, I I don't know. I thought it was to be talking about the same thing that H ninety five was, but since since it's not over since, there yet. since this on the bus is going to be totally it's, different. Yeah, I, and it's it's not there yet. So it's yeah, so I don't know why. Else. I don't know what the Doesn't specific bill is that we're going to be talking. about. I will give the same pitch no matter what. No. <laughs> yeah, right, give me your idea. Yeah, it was, it, it was pretty exciting. Barry like, totally surprised us all. I walked up, he walked and told, asked the committee, he's like, why don't you just write us a check? Yeah. You know, don't give it to the public service Yeah, department. don't give it to the public service department. Just you know, <laughs> give it to CV, Fiber, and WEC, and we'll go tell you if this is feasible or not. And they didn't say, they didn't say no. So. <laughs> they, 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 all they did was for, you know, they reduced it from 75 to 50. Gotcha. Well, you said they put it in at the 50 for the feasibility, but it was for any electric company, right? Yeah, the, the electric ones. I, I think that my, my right, it was that for the step, the pilots? Well, they can throw the a pilot in there, but, the, but you know, one of the chunks is for the public service department to do the feasibility that's the study. That's 50. Yeah. And then there's the 100, and I think that that's earmarked to electric companies for yeah. pilot studies. I think feasibility, I mean, they include pilots. At, Thing, comma, comma, pilot. <laughs> I don't know what they mean. By the time he gets to Senate, it'll be straight down. So, so now I'll say a pilot feasibility study. And yeah, you get all the right words, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, 2.30 p.m. is uh, scheduled for talking about S91, an act relating to electric companies and broadband internet access service. I think that's the Senate, um, Senate sibling, sibling of, of the, the uh, whatever H, yeah. whatever it was. They, that we talked about before that's already been subsumed by. by. By the way, it's modeled on the Virginia thing that you worked on, right? Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. yeah. So, um, do, um, and I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but um, do we want to endorse the the bill as it currently, as I sent you the copy of? I mean, I know there's some, some changes in there, Michael, that, that you submitted there, but do we want to endorse it and send it to them and just, as a board, as a board, and I mean, like I said, it's it's honestly, it's probably going to go through. That's my instinct. And please correct me if you, Michael or Jim, I think it's going to go through. If you yeah. think it's wrong, I mean, if, if we want to sort of put our foot on it and push it out the door, or help it get it doesn't hurt, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay, and, it's, and I, I don't think it's necessary either. Does, any, does anybody have a feeling? Why don't we give you the authority to advocate for it if it becomes necessary? I, well, I already have been, so. I have sent emails and I've you know, said, you know, these are these are things that I like. And I've, I've showed up there and said, here are the good ideas, here are the bad ideas. You know, <laughs> set it to fiber. If you want to build us to build fiber, incentivize the building of fiber. And they said, eh, 25.3 cables, a minimum standard, which whatever. <laughs> so we, we could say, we could support it and say 100 to 100 or whatever, or we could just I, we could leave it as is. Right. I am comfortable with 25.3. I don't think it should be 100 to 100 yet. I think that we should allow the WISP <coughs> to catch up because the technology is still improving for wireless, and there are towns that are not going to get fiber projects for a while. Our towns may, but as an example, on, on that committee, there's uh, Mark. Bigman from Lowell mm -hmm. has been dying to get something up there, and no one wants to go do fiber there. But if there's a 25-3 incentive for a WISP to improve in that town, there is a WISP there, not mine. I think it's a good thing for them. And they can, can, there is one provision in there that I really like in the connectivity part of that. It says, has to be continuously upgradable. <laughs> that means that's the reason why DSL is not going to go there. Not be, bonded, bonded pair could get to 25, but it DSL. cannot get no. continuously upgraded to 100. But fiber can and wireless can. Right. So I think it's well, fine. Well, Comcast will argue that, that they can too. They're welcome. We're just eliminating twisted pair, which is dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was hoping we, I was hoping we could leapfrog, but. I, I don't. I don't think it wish. would be fair to the other ISPs. I, I, as much as I don't like Comcast, I don't think it'd be but fair to them or Charter or any of the others that can deliver but why, good service. But why invest state funds in cable? Because it's, it's going to be capable of a cable. 
So if they can do it, let them. If they can't, they won't. Okay. Is it really capable of a gig? Not yet. But that's, that's, there's, get in there. They haven't hit the laws of physics yet. Yeah. There's some Twisted pair of copper has. That's, that's dead end. Because physics. Yeah. Is there anything in here about it being verifiably that fast? Or any sort of like check on that? That's the thing. Um, um, my next bit. Yeah, so that that would be um, that that would be an interesting thing to to put in there. Yeah, there's there's not, as far as as far as I know. I mean, and the, I, I don't know that we have the bureaucracy or the infrastructure to test that aside from DPS doing fun things like driving around with uh, cell phones in the seat. I mean, it's a fun, fun job if you can get it, but <laughs> I mean, and and something something that the um, I'm trying to remember. I know we were talking about it, but they would, I mean, they'd love to see, I'm sure they'd love to see, you know, speed test results from all over the place and be able to say, hey, DSL advertises this and this is what we have to get now. Can we actually regulate that? Or, I mean, can we, can Vermont actually regulate that? Not really. Yeah. It's, it's federal, federally can advertise it. Yeah, right. Can the Attorney General, though, uh, file consumer protection well, against it? Yeah. And they could fair. just make public information. Hey, here's what they say, here's what they do. What do you think, public? Yeah. That's not regulating, but it's powerful. Or so, yeah. anonymized data from speed test apps and stuff, where you can just mm -hmm. they could provide that, or it could be asked that you know they could bill for it or whatever. But it, it just, and, and something that was talked about at the Southern Vermont Connectivity Summit was, in addition to doing the survey, because because they, they were uh, crowdsourcing survey questions there as well, is including in the survey a link to do a speed test. Yeah. So. Click that link, it pops out another window, does the speed test, and you can copy and paste the results into the into the survey. Um, I don't know if that if that's something that we want to do, but that would be some could be some interesting data. The the problem is when you do the speed test, um, what the weather was that day could can change that, and it may not be as, where, as where interesting. Where is the server located that the testing to? Whether the question was out there. Data, <laughs> data, 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 yeah. Right. So that's all I've got for the um, all the state house and policy stuff. Is there anything anybody else wants to add? Okay, we're basically on track. Um, review of back burner items. Did I miss anything? No. Okay. Yeah, review on track. Review of back burner items, committee assignments, and membership. Is there anything that we need committees to do or look at that? Um, or things that we need to add to our to our back burner that we need to put on a future agenda item. Um, Random thought driving across the FDF listening to NPR talk about who way and, and cybersecurity issues and so forth. Do we want to put as a back burner that somewhere down the line we should write up a policy that states these are the standards on which we're going to reference as far as what equipment we can use and what, what security it hits and not my area of expertise, but I'm sure the people in the room who have that. And the state of Vermont just adopted a standard. I mean, it'd be easy enough to adopt adopt theirs yep. in turn. So yeah, I'll put that on the next agenda. We can just have that as a discussion item. Um, a budget for the next fiscal year. We need to start thinking about that Jeez. one. And I mean, there, there's still a great deal of indecision regarding our, our actual operating business model and all that. So, but you know, I, I mean, at a certain point, we need to start working on a budget for next year soon. Sounds like a great thing for the Finance Committee. We <laughs> well, <laughs> that, at least to, to give us a skeleton. <laughs> well, I, the, um, yes, I, that's no problem, but I need an assumption as to the business model we should be developing a budget for. I, I think without a business plan, it's hard, hard to say. Yes. So I, I need an assumption to, to work with. Are we to assume that we're going to be contracting everything out? Are we going to assume, should we assume we're going to be providing no, whatever service? Ask, ask, ask us again in April. We're, I, going, I think. we're going to contract out a study of some sort, a business model development, okay. probably. We haven't voted to do that, but it's, yes. it's like, we seem to be headed that way. But beyond that, that's going to inform us how to make the decisions about all the rest of contracting. So 
Would I be able then to get somebody from the Business Development Committee, maybe, uh, to show up at the next Finance Committee meeting to help us start thinking about the budget and how we should be looking at trying to prepare whatever needs to be prepared? Because I think these two really interact at this point. Yeah. It's going to be a real budget this time. So takers from the when is your when is your next finance meeting? Um, we we we've been having them lately right before this meeting, before the regular board meeting. Uh, so th does that mean your next one is going to be when when are we on the sixteenth? The twelfth. Do we want to plan on it that way? Good. Okay. That's a meeting. Yeah. Have somebody from business development there. Siobhan. Sure. Was that an agreement to have that, it on that day? That, 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 okay. <laughs> it'll be what it'll be. It will be an hour. It will be an hour <laughs> before the meeting at five o'clock up at the um, in Berlin, up at the Maplewoods. Uh, oh, the Maplewoods across from the school. Yeah, we yeah. take over yeah, the Maplewoods. Yeah. <laughs> Get them out of there. Okay, I'll do. I can. I can. I can. They have food that they make us pay for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Community <laughs> service. You can go to Applebee's instead if you want. You can no. use the men's room. <laughs> okay. Um, any any other committee stuff? Back burner writings committee stuff. Do any of the new folks want to? Mm. That's a good call. So <laughs> folks who have recently been been added or um, joining the board. Um, any committees that you'd like to join? Intent. <laughs> I'm on one, all right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, you're, so you're good. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's what? So we have finance, business development, and policy. policy. Interested, Frank? Policy. Okay. That's exciting stuff. Okay. So next time there's, there's a policy to be done, um, we'll put you on there. So um, I'm going to move to add Frank Moore to the policy committee. So Maple Woods is at five. Then you guys. Okay. So it's yes. seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Or <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. Mm -hmm. um, quarter of six. We can quarter of five. Coordinate with Jim. Four forty-five. Whenever I'll, I'll that, that happens. Okay. Uh, we have approval of January eighth okay. meeting minutes. Thank you for putting those together. Back up. Um, anything I in there that uh, looks at you that needs courses. to be changed or updated or anything? I didn't, I didn't see anything in there that was uh, shocking or surprising. Everything, but this, this might make sense. I'm going to make a motion. Oh. Okay. Second. So January 8th meeting. It's moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Oh, sorry, motion passes. Right. Those minutes are approved. Um, did those go out onto the Facebook page, do you know? Yeah. They did great. If I converted them, because I always have trouble with that because you can't do PDFs, but I converted them to JPEGs, Ooh. and that's, that worked. Sounds great. Okay, we've got um, a round table. We'll start with you, Rama. I, uh, no, I just really welcome Frank. I, you know, when I went in front of the uh, Williamstown Select Board when this first started, I told him that I wanted to be the delegate, but I wanted to look for somebody who was actually qualified to sit on the board. And I really think for where this organization is right now at this point in time, is uh, Frank Moore brings in some very valuable experience. So I look forward to his participation. And, and now you have the bandwidth to join the WEC board and push that from that, from that side, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, many of you here could, uh, could do that. The nominations were closed. But yeah. we, just, we just missed it. <laughs> we could have all nominated each other. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jerry? Um, nothing for me other than we, um, we'll, have a, we'll, we'll have a business development uh, meeting next. I'm not sure when, but we'll, we'll, I'll send an email around and we'll figure out when folks when folks can do it. We're, we're a little bit out of sync. We were aiming for the end of the month in order to be prepared the week before or 10 days before the um, this meeting. Um, but that, that's fallen out of sync now, so we, we've got to get back to that. But there's 
a lot of individual work that's been going on. So, um, welcome, Frank. Thank you. Just only that I'm happy that we're now talking about <coughs> five and six figure dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Working our way up. Frank? Uh, we had a little email interchange about a policy topic, which is um, should there be a sort of, a, I think of it as a separate track in dealing with those parts of our region that do have cable, um, where um, because of density, because of potential commercial customers, schools, um, there may be some opportunities there to provide some competition. Um, so I, I ask that we consider what that would look like. As a, not not a replacement of dealing with the underserved, but as a second piece of the, of the longer term piece of, the, of, of this district. I'm good. Um, I hope I get a poster so I can put it up at town meeting. Um, how many people here put their uh, report had a, put a report in the town report? Not a lot. Is it true? <laughs> Ooh, they sent it. All right, just check. I don't know if it's it really is going to take a lot of work to keep everybody engaged. I didn't get that far yet. I think ours is in the town report. I'm sure hard draft there. I sent it. Because <laughs> <laughs> Bruce was like, hey, so. Okay. Um, I'm expecting the, the next meeting, which is in, what, two weeks? I'm expecting that to be um, rather short. Because so, I don't know that there's really that much going on between now and two weeks from now. So we'll see. Yeah, I guess it's all I got. Um, I think between the, the presentations that we've had over the past couple of months and the, um, the stuff that's going on in the legislature, uh, it really comes together. It's a lot of, a lot of good ideas starting to formulate, and uh, I think maybe we can find a, a real direction out of that. I, uh, I am going to be standing up at, I, I've got the select board to say that I can, because I didn't get on the agenda. But I'm going to stand up at town meeting and talk about us because we need another delegate or an, uh, an alternate. No. Um, and so I'm going to be, I, because I have a tendency to ramble, you may or may not have noticed, um, I'm going to have talking points. And so I'm, I'm going to be making some points and I'll, I'll go ahead and send those around as well so, because um, I'm going to try and focus on what I think they're going to care about as citizens of Orange rather than well, it's going to be great if these blazing fast speeds is more, you know, okay, we're not adding your tax burden, or, you know, it's, it's, because that's going to be the first question, Absolutely. is, and, and so I want to, and I've been kind of percolating around, but I haven't written it down, so I'll let that happen, and I have to add Woodbury to the poster before I say that. No, thanks. Good to go. Pass. Uh, yeah, I, I guess just, it's, I like the way things are starting to kind of gel a little bit too in terms of um, WEC and the legislature and some other stuff. And I, my own perspective, I guess it's taken me a while to get there. Is we just kind of got to view ourselves a lot more as the customer and what we represent in terms of our communities rather than us being the operational people. We need partners, so that's good. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think the partnership and, and contracting for most of the work that we'll have to do is going to be the way to go seems to be a trend that we're hearing through a lot of the presentations so it's sort of good to at least see some consistency I think mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. cool. Last one. Yes. Okay. Thanks everybody I'm with the